Oh, you did? Oh, oh cool. Shit. No, my nicotine <laughs> use is on camera. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Is there a trash can? I can. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got. I can take it from you. Oh, dude, it's in my mouth. I don't want you to. <laughs> Here, take this for me. I, I've had to take gum out of um, people's mouths. So Yo, like, what not, the not fuck? Take, not like take it like, because like we set up everything and then it's just like, it's hard if they get up. Oh, yeah. Let me just take it and then be good. Let me figure out. There's two headsets under here. How do you guys know each other? Literally found him off of peer space. I think I have your. If you want to grab under the table, what am I grabbing? Oh, the like headphones. Headphones. Yeah. Okay, cool. It's over there. Yeah, dude. I literally was like looking around because I was like, shit. I want to like film a podcast and like I don't have like the energy or know how to try and figure out how to do it. So I was like, fuck I mean, it. Let me find somewhere that's just like full stop. Yeah. Yo, what the fuck? Outsourcing is a good idea for sure. Mm-hmm. Can I? Oh, I was like, I was like, what the uh, fuck is going on here? I was like, I don't want to break them, but like, this okay. seems really fucked up. No, I, I went through the same thought process. <laughs> I was like, wait a second. Yeah, that Neanderthal strength will kick in real fast, dude. Dude, exactly. Yeah. My fucking girlfriend was making fun of me because I uh, ripped, straight up ripped off the handle to my freezer. Oh, really? Uh, like, dude, it's like one of those like little chest things, and I just like grabbed it and yanked it and just snapped right off. And it was just sitting in the corner. She was like, what the fuck? is wrong with you i was like i grabbed it and i don't want to fix it i don't know you look like you'd be fucking freakishly strong i haven't trained with you so i I don't know um i don't know i i don't feel like i'm freakishly strong because i'm big but like i'll train like brady or someone Mm -hmm. where he's like 160 but like brady will grab a hold of me and i'm like this doesn't feel good yeah yeah like he's got some weird strength you know michael kravetsky from odyssey he'll show the shot yeah yeah i haven't rolled with him yet but uh he grabbed me one time to like uh he was showing us something and i was like oh can i feel it and he put it on, and I was like, damn, this motherfucker's strong as hell. I mean, he was, like, in the NFL or, like, collegiate football or something like that. Yeah, probably played college football. I don't know exactly what he did. He looks like he should have played football. He told me one time, he was like, I'm the smallest man in my family. That's scary. I was like, that, that and also he sends me uh, memes all the time that say, I'm going to touch you. <laughs> <laughs> like, the all of these fucked up memes on my Instagram, and I'm like, I don't know how I feel about this coming from you, because yeah. a lot of people, I'm like, okay, I can fight back. Yeah, exactly. He's so big. Yeah, he hits like, you with that dark humor, and you're like, I don't know. I'm like, I scared. hope it's just humor. Like, please, please don't have humor. this get serious. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Sean Strickland, he's like, yeah, I grapple. So, or no, Justin Gage, he's like, I grapple. So if two dudes try and grab me, <laughs> yeah. I can fight back. If one man can hold you, two can fuck you. Yeah. That's bad. Uh, that's yeah. bad for business. Yeah. <laughs> bad. Uh, well, probably bad for the mental health. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Good for a prostate doctor, maybe. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> <laughs> Are we live? Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> that just makes it better. It's fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't like he starts getting everything set up. He said it was starting a minute ago. So gotcha. it's okay. We'll uh, we'll keep all the fucked up clips in here. Brady made a bunch of 9-11 jokes. Like, it's, nice. I approve. It just gets more and more i love when white up. people are like really like into 9-11 being uh inside job yeah it almost takes the pressure off my shoulders of like oh, thank god you don't think like i did it you know what i mean like no i think it's an inside job thank you thank you is that why you're friends with me yes the, the only the reason, only reason. Yeah. if i if i didn't this this would not be happening uh, uh there would be no podcast yeah. no it's uh i feel like the, the general sentiment is now that more people are starting to think that some fuckery happened thank god yeah, I was going to say, just goes back to taking the pressure it's off great of for us. Dude, you know who I really feel bad for is the Sikhs. You know what a yeah. Sikh is? Yeah, one of my good friends is Sikh. Okay, cool. So they look super Muslim. Mm-hmm. Like, they have, like, the turban and all that stuff. And, like, after 9-11, I'm sorry for laughing about it, but after 9-11, there was, like, an increase of hate crime towards, like, Middle Eastern people and, like, Muslim-looking people. But, like, they got it the worst, for sure. And because they look super Muslim. Like, okay. If they sat next to me on a plane, I'm Middle Eastern and Muslim, and I'd be a little nervous. I'm like, yo, who the fuck is this guy? Like, <laughs> Why is this guy got a turban you know what I mean? on? What are we doing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, like, I couldn't imagine just being, like, a country white dude from, like, bumfuck nowhere, and you see this guy, and you're like, oh, my God. And all you do is watch, like, the That's news. That's one of them. Like, That's one of them. You Damn. know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Like, it's got to be, you know, I, I sympathize. I empathize with the the old racist white man <laughs> but handshake emoji yeah. but it's kind of fucked too because they're like not even muslim they're not even like close to muslim i think they're uh, so far from it they're so far from it but they look very muslim so sorry for the Sikhs, but you took one for us i appreciate it that's just being a good team player alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. <laughs> exactly yeah. they're like i guess we say that now too fuck it it's so funny because you've seen such a pivot for it now there's like this like uh 
glamorization of all those Chechen dudes because of MMA. And yeah. like people are watching videos of Hamza like screaming. He's like, God giving, uh, God willing, you give me rifle, send me to yeah, Gaza. Yeah, exactly. He's screaming Allahu Akbar in the, uh, it's in cool the tunnel. Nowadays. And now everyone's like, fuck yeah, I yeah, want to go to Chechen and be Muslim. Bullshit. I hate but like it. 20 years ago, it was yeah. like, that was a hate crime waiting to happen. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, where was this glamorization when I was a kid growing up? How old are you? <laughs> I'm 29. Oh shit. Okay. I thought you were. I don't know why I thought you were 30 or 31. It's I look like I'm 50. I've aged through jujitsu and being Middle Eastern. We age like sour milk on the really? sidewalk. Yeah, my people, we, we don't last long. Where are you from? Like, where's your family from? Uh, we were sure. born. We were all born in Iraq. Okay. And then uh, you were born in Iraq. I was born there. Yes. And Holy then, shit. Yeah, I know. Right. But I came here when I was three. So I'm super Americanized. But oh, I've, still. Yeah. Like we so we were born in Iraq and then we went to Turkey. And then we, uh, like in Istanbul, and then we went to America at uh, three. God damn. So, okay, so you were, what, born in 95? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then 98 is when we came to America, and, like, the 90s era is, like, kind of, like, where the Gulf War was happening. Um, and then after that, when we came to America, so we got sponsored by a church in Cartersville where it came okay. as, like, refugees. And then a church sponsored us, and Cartersville gave us a house. Holy shit. That's and that awesome. was 98. Bro, you got out. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you got out. Perfect time. Yeah, a few years later, they're like, nah, we're full, dude. We can't take you. <laughs> oh, my God. Right in September, they're like, no, 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 no. Dude, y'all beat the fucking clock by three <laughs> years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thankfully, we fled early enough. Uh, but... <laughs> Yeah, I always thought about that. It's like we got super lucky. Uh, and like it was just all very like random, I guess. It's like, uh, have you ever heard the theory of random? Side note. No. The theory of like <clears throat> what is random is like uh, it's our inability to calculate what like that result was, like how it, because you know, like especially dudes, it's like something happens, your brain logically kind of works backwards. You're like, how did that happen? It's like, let's say, you know some guy from like some other activity like church or some skating rink and then you go to some gym and then you see that guy there and you're like oh dude so random you're here but like if you knew each other from this other scenario like what are the chances that he also lives and has a similar life to you and you guys run into each other a different facet it's actually not that random if you think about it it's like but we'll say random that's a that's a terrible example but like it's just a, our inability to calculate we just say random because our brain can't adjust it yeah, because that in your brain probably doesn't want to be like, oh, I am just the I'm the member. dumbest. <laughs> yeah, like I'm just a member of this group, dude. I met a guy in uh, California one time, and we were sitting there talking, and he like owns a uh, like a solar company, like they do solar installs on roofs and stuff. Drives a Tesla, lived in like a nice apartment building, whatever. Like dresses a certain way. He was like, I literally was parking my Tesla to charge at the station in my apartment complex. Another guy in a black Tesla got out of the car, dressed very similar, like. It, like in shape like worked out uh, both of them lived in like orange county and he was like oh i run like a home service it was like a home services or like some other like niche type mm -hmm. thing and he was like i sat there and in that moment i was like oh i am literally a marketing demographic yeah like carbon copy i am a marketing demographic yeah it's like that all kinds of things even when i go to jujitsu tournaments and it's like i run into other people who like all they do is jujitsu too it's mm -hmm. like and just from different areas of like the world or the country or whatever um, and you find out you have so much more in common with them than like you don't, you know what I mean? So like, I've only had like maybe one or two people I've competed against, like who like whether win or lose, it's like, there was some weird like tension, but like almost everybody, like we're all su super cool to each other, whether I win or lose, it's like very like respectful and everyone's like, cause we're all on the same like goal and like has the same mission. So like, I feel like people can respect that. You know what I mean? And too, jujitsu attracts like a, there's a unique type of person you have to get however you want to set it up yeah, yeah. i just like, move around a lot dude i do too i'm yeah, like yeah. way too fidgety yeah same <laughs> it's like jujitsu attracts like a, a weird type of person in a way where it's like everyone from whatever like strata of life you're in like all has some screw that's loose it's like i personally enjoy trying to maim my friends a few yeah, nights exactly. a week <laughs> like that's my idea of a good time yeah i think it's like part of it's like innate because like fighting is very innate um like with humans and even like animals like if you ever watch like cats fight or like bears fight it's like they pull guard and like they headlock each other and like pin each other it's like they're doing jujitsu or like our perception of what jujitsu is rather and it's like very innate but i feel like socially um like people condition you to like not be aggressive and i feel like people uh also like hey, how we grow up like boys naturally want to fight kids like if you've ever teach a kids class kids want to fight like it's in their blood to want to wrestle it's just like after a while like like socially you know 
people are taught to not be aggressive. So it's kind of looked down upon. People like when I tell people I do jujitsu, they almost like think I'm going to be super aggressive. But then like when they find out that I'm actually like this all the time, I'm just chilling all the time. It's like, yeah, I'm actually not aggressive at all. But it's like there's that social conditioning. And then also, too, I think like the difficulty of it, because it is extremely difficult to yes. like be held down and like someone sweating your eyeball for like an hour straight. You know what I mean? It's terrible, dude. But like it, like you said, it takes that certain person to be like, oh, I failed at this. I need to come back and get better at it. Like, I feel like jujitsu has taught me persistence more than anything else. Cause like jujitsu is really like long game. If you can just keep showing up and be intentional, it's like you will get better, especially if you're in the right environment. But there's people who've done a lot with a lot less in all facets of life. So what got you into it? Like, you, okay. So you're a black belt. I'm a brown belt. I thought you were a black belt. No, I'm a brown belt. Why I, did I think you were a black belt? Uh, I don't know, but I, oh. probably cause you only okay. see me wear no gi stuff. So that's probably true. Yeah, I probably don't see my belt. Um, no, I've been training for like almost 15 ish years. And then, uh, I've been a brown belt. Uh, I think it'll be six years, uh, end of next month. Holy shit. Yeah. But, uh, but also too, like if you switch teams, like that kind of happens naturally because you yeah. have to like kind of situate to what, like what their curriculum is and like what they deem as important for black belt. Cause every, that's the thing about the belting system in jujitsu. It's like, it's so subjective. It's very different than like traditional martial arts, even like judo, where like you go pretty much anywhere and like the testing requirements to get your yellow belt. It's pretty much the same stuff. Um, but in jujitsu, it's very different. And it's different from like gym to gym, like that teach virtually the same stuff. Let's say there's two gi jujitsu gyms and they're mostly gi, maybe they're mostly IBJJF or whatever, like they still are probably going to belt you differently and like what they deem is important. And they're pretty freaking similar. But if you like, in my case, went from like more of a gi jujitsu background to like 10 planet, it's extreme. It's almost like a, a different martial art almost. You know what I mean? Uh, it is, but it isn't, but it's, a uh, like, it's going to take even longer to adjust. Like, I feel like it took me a while to like adjust from going from gi to no gi. than if I would have went from no gi to gi and that's something looking back on, I wish I would have focused more on no gi at first because I did focus on MMA at first and then it turned to gi and that because that's just what like my coaches and environment wanted me to do. So I was like, cool. I mean, that's what you do. Like you just pick the gym closest to you and you're like, I'll just do what everyone else is doing. You know what I mean? Um, and then after that, then it turned into just predominantly no gi. I still train gi every now and then, but like once a week max. I tried more than that. I was like, I might do a comeback. And then I trained like three times in one week in the gi on top of training a bunch. And I was like, this sucks, dude. It's not worth it. Your fingers hurt. And you're like, what am I doing? Yeah. Like, the tournament wasn't even for that much money. It was like 500 bucks and it ended up, ended up falling through. And I was like, oh, thank God. I was, like, All right. like, I was like, God, it wasn't even worth it to me. I gave it, an, I gave it my effort. All right. I can just write that off. I don't exactly. have to. Yeah. <laughs> what, um, you said it would honestly, you thought it would have been easier going from no gi to gi than the inverse. Yeah. So the reason what I mean by that is like, so like if you start at a gi focused gym and everything's taught like based off gi grips, then like once you take the gi off, that game just doesn't exist at all. Like you can't really play spider guard, no gi. Like I guess you could try, but like no chance. Yeah. It's just not going to work like realistically. And like, here's the thing. When we say stuff doesn't work in jujitsu, we just mean like it's a numbers game. Like Look at, look at it through the scientific method of like a meta analysis. A meta analysis is like not just one study, but it's like the average of a bunch of studies across the board. And it's like it has to be high percentage. It's like why put all your effort in something that's low percentage, right? So like Nogi Spider Guard, not very high percentage. But half guard passing in Nogi, very high percentage. And What's crazy too is like when you go to gi, it's also high percentage. If anything, it might be more, it might be higher percentage because of all the friction from the gi and then you can add stuff to it. But fundamentally, it's still the same that it was in no gi, but then you add handles to it. So like if you understand how to control from someone from like a split squat or like knee cut, knee shield type position, I fucking hate jujitsu. There's so many names for shit. I hate it so much. It <laughs> yeah, and me you off, went dude. to a uh, tenth planet, so you get a whole different like lexicon. <laughs> dude, it's like it's like every gym just likes to have their own names for stuff, and like a lot of them make sense to some degree. It's just like the the differences of dialect is just like annoying. But it's it's like I appreciate that about judo. It's like it's one name. It's yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, cool. It's Japanese. Maybe you have to learn this weird form of Japanese that people don't even talk in really, but at least we all agree. It's Uchimata. <laughs> like, it's one thing like no one's debating that. Yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, like I think, uh, 
going from no gi to gi, you can have like a good fundamental base of controlling someone from like a split squat or knee cut type position where if you can do that with just your body and then once you add the handle of the jacket, then it's like, all right, now that's extra. But if you need the jacket to be able to hold them down, it's like, do you fundamentally understand how to control them from that position? Maybe not. Um, you have to put into account that they're going to be using gi grips too. And not all the time, but a lot of times when someone makes a gi grip on you, it's advantageous to make a gi grip back to eliminate their ability. So like if someone grabs your sleeve, you could just break the grip, but like, you know, nine times out of 10, what are they going to do? Just going to grab your sleeve again. Yeah, exactly. Right back. Like, yeah. Thanks, now give it That's back. the issue with grip breaking. People just break grips and they're like, all right, now I'm just going to sit here and let you do it again. But, and you'll just get into this like loop. But if you like, instead of just thinking of breaking the grip, he's like, you nullify the grip and almost make it like a liability. So like if you circle your hand and grab their sleeve, now it's like, all right, I have you. Now you can't go anywhere. I can pull or I can push this. And like, yeah, that's good too. But like fundamentally how to keep them into that position, like it's going to benefit you, in my opinion, to start no gi and then work to gi. Because I noticed when I was doing a lot of gi and I went to no gi, I was like, I feel like I had to start over. But then once I did enough no gi, maybe like a year or two, and I started to like understand parts of it fundamentally a little bit more of how like wedge my body around their body and not just rely on like wedging through like uh, tension creating the jacket because mm -hmm. that's very strong. It's it's very strong. But like I've also had matches where I was like, damn, I can't get my grips. And it's like hard to get your game going. But it's like if you can just like wrap your arms around them and just like put weight onto them, then you add the gi, then it's like, oh, this feels better now like i every time i went from like doing a lot of nogi to gi that first session would be a little weird because i'm like oh yeah the grips but once i understood like when to when like i needed to make grips like when i'm on bottom playing guard it's like yeah you got to make these grips dog because they're going to make those grips first and if you don't address those pant grips and they just run around your guard it's really frustrating they don't even have to be great they just have to like do it with conviction and it can catch you off guard but like if you have their sleeves and stuff that like it's kind of hard for them to do that but if you're on top you know what I mean? You don't really need to grab their gi. It's just like little extra handles to like put pressure. In. I mean, my game, at least like for me, it's like, I just fucking lay my body weight on you and play by ear. That works. Yeah. Just lay not on super you. scrambling. You don't have to fucking run <sighs> around and gas out. Dude, I hate that shit. I hate moving. It's like, I'll do it if I need to. And it's like some days I do want to move because it feels good to like move around and like work hard. But at the same time, if I could just lay on you and not let you move at all, it's like that's that's kind of like the idea of jujitsu. I feel like it's like efficiency over everything. So if I have to like work hard to do something, I'd rather not. A hundred percent. And too, it's like I'll train with like a, we've got a guy named Matt Principe who's like two seventy or something like that. And it's like I train with him all the time, and I'm like, Who the fuck do I want to get into a scramble for? And like run the risk of his big ass laying on me, and now I'm sitting there like dying inside control. Yeah, and if it's in the gi, he just grabs on that <laughs> cloth, and I'm like, oh no, I'll just kill myself now. How much do you weigh? Uh, two thirty. Two thirty. Yeah, you're a pretty big guy. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, is like, it's weird. Once you start going up in weight, it's like, all right, like, I don't know. Maybe this is an unpopular opinion, but I feel like two thirty to two seventy feels like a bigger gap than what is that? Two thirty. That's forty pounds. So one ninety. Yeah, like when I go with a guy, so I'm one. 80 185 right now when i go with a guy who's 155 or 145 yeah there's a guy who rolls who's about 145 150 uh named brian parker i roll him pretty often like i'm bigger than him but i also don't feel like there's that issue of me dropping all my body weight on him and like killing him essentially yeah <laughs> we're comparative to like if i go with someone who's 40 pounds heavier than me it's like brother that's still almost 300 pounds just laying on my ribs weird it's like it gets risky it's like i kind of hate for I had a student who was like in that super heavyweight division where it's like 222 and up or whatever. Yeah. Or ultra heavyweight. And he wanted to go down to super heavyweight where it's like below 222. But he was it was hard for him to make that weight. And it's like one time he was like, oh, I'll just do the heavyweight division. And then he got he got some guy that was like 350. And he's like, bro, he's like maybe like 230, 240. And I was like, dude, you should have cut that weight. Yeah. <laughs> and in that moment, he was like, God damn it, I should have quit eating sweets. Yeah, dude. <laughs> he was like, Yeah, I should have just cut that weight. I was like, Yeah. Yeah, I feel bad for those in betweener big dudes. Um, it kind of sucks being like an in betweener between like 170 and like 190 because then you're almost expected to go with like the bigger guys. But I've learned to, I have to have limits at times because if I'm going with a 300 pound guy and he just falls on me weird, like I'm out of training for a while and then that affects my livelihood. I, yeah, I was about to say because you're running a school. So yeah, running like a school, can... like teaching privates, like. Even training, like the way I look at training is like it's not just for like getting 
for competition, but it's like also to like further my craft to be better at my job too. So it's almost like personal development as well. It's like, if I can't do that, it's like, well, I'm also doing a disservice to my students, not getting like better at teaching and like doing jujitsu as well. So, and I've had that happen to you, just unnecessary stuff. Like people follow me weird and hurt me or like, uh, even like skin infections and stuff like that. Like if I notice someone's got someone on their skin, it's like, yeah, dude, I'm not rolling with you. I've got staff on my leg right now. Nice, dude. Yeah. Let me lick it. Second time this year. <laughs> dude, if you want fucking staff on your tongue, go for it. <laughs> I'm trying to think the worst infection I've had was actually not even from jujitsu. I'm pretty sure I got it from the Chattahoochee River. It's actually pretty recent. Oh, it probably was. <laughs> yeah, it was 100% from yeah, the river. Yeah, I got cellulitis. Um, oh, Jesus I have like Christ. I have like a psoriasis on my legs. It's like mm-hmm. an autoimmune disorder. Yeah. And, uh, it's like I have scales on my legs. Hell yeah. Yeah. Scales like a lizard. But uh, I, I guess I just didn't know I had a cut on my leg from the psoriasis. And when I was in the river, I don't think I was even like in the river, like shooting the hoods or anything. I just like was walking through there, just chilling and then uh, got infected. My leg was swollen so much that I couldn't walk within like a day. Like it felt a lump on my shin and then it turned to my whole calf. I remember when I went to training like a few days after antibiotics, like I wasn't even training. I was just kind of hanging out. And someone looked at my leg and they were like, dude, your calf is like three times as big as your other calf. And I honestly thought I was going to have to lose my leg because like they gave me antibiotics, uh, Bactrim for two weeks and it kind of helped, kind of didn't. And then they had to give me another one, uh, doxycycline. They had to give me another really strong one. And, uh, it finally started to go down at the end. So I had to be on antibiotics for four weeks straight two different antibiotics that's good for your stomach that's great i feel great i threw up every (laughs) day for a week straight in training i hated it it was like the third or fourth week because then i got done with the first round and my gut was like all right we've done that but then like on to the second round immediately my gut was like all right dude we're not used to this and then i had to do actually a few more days at the end of those four weeks uh so four weeks and five days oh my god so i did like three cycles back to back i didn't tell anyone about the fifth one or the, <laughs> the, 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 i want to fucking train it's they told me it's not going to spread just it'll be fine dude it was more so just because like like it was dying down and i wasn't contagious and it's cellulitis is on the inside of my leg too i didn't even have a wound which is the crazy part it was like there was no wound it was just it just ballooned up ballooned up and it was like red and purple like around my calf uh, or my shin and uh i wasn't contagious for a while like i was already training mm-hmm. like after like uh i think i waited like two three weeks just to be safe and then uh, once i started training uh I realized like it just still wasn't getting better so i had to get on uh three <laughs> back-to-back cycles of uh the antibiotics and then i had to do another one like a month after that because it flared up again and i was just like dude what is life fuck that yeah dude it comes on quick when i got it the first time i literally trained thursday night friday i had to fly to la for this thing and so like i didn't really notice anything friday saturday i was like up all day at this like event it was like a real estate investor thing yeah and i'm like my, i was like fuck man like my leg is kind of itchy and i was like all right like whatever literally got back to this airbnb we were staying at and like looked down and i had the fattest white head you've ever seen and i was like uh-oh i don't think it's supposed to look like that and i was like all right we're gonna bite the bullet and i popped that shit yeah. it was disgusting oh yeah and then um i was like i think i have staff and i woke up in the middle of the night because like i like rolled over and the inside of my leg was like ballooned up it oh, like hurt yeah. to touch dude i was limping like a fucking like <laughs> i don't like i was limping like i had been shot through yeah, fucking yeah. lax like trying to get oh, to the gate God. i was like <laughs> this is so bad then literally same thing on the second one where it was like morning of i was like oh like it doesn't look like that bad it just kind of looked like an ingrown hair and i was like all mm-hmm. right whatever and then literally later that day same thing was just like laying on the couch and like my leg like hit the pillow or some shit and i was like that really hurt yeah i don't think it was supposed to feel like that yeah. like looked at it and i was like oh i don't think that's good and they were like yeah here you're gonna be on doxycycline for 10 days and i was yep. like perfect dude yesterday morning i was in the car and i was like nauseous as fuck just like driving yep. i was like it just like saps the energy from you. Saps the energy, makes you nauseous. Uh, yeah, it's all really annoying. But I mean, honestly, like I just started taking like super strong uh, probiotics, like the ones that are like refrigerated. I would get the high potency ones from like the back of Costco at the pharmacy. And they're expensive. They're like 60 bucks or like 40 bucks for like the really good ones. But you'll have like a month or two supply. And I always like have been taking that now. Uh, it didn't help a ton. I just drink raw milk. Yeah, dude. Fuck yeah. I fucking love raw milk. Primal. Dude, I like it. It's dude. so good. Fucking yeah. for animal consumption only. Who's your uh, who's your plug? Are uh, you legally allowed to say? Uh on the air? 
uh, my dog that I definitely have <laughs> yeah. that definitely lives in my place that really enjoys it uh, gets his from Nuts and Berries in Brookhaven. Oh, nice, dude. Dude, it's it, – okay, I rant about this shit to anyone that will listen. <laughs> They're going out of business dude, immediately after that. <laughs> dude, no. Dude, they sell out. Oh, yeah. They sell out so quickly. I bet they do. Dude, it's so good. It's like I could not – like I don't think I drank milk from the time I was like 10 or 11 until I started drinking raw milk. And before – like I would uh, go to farmer's markets – all mm-hmm. the time and get it and i literally was <laughs> uh talking to this girl off of hinge and i had a hinge prompt at the time about it and she was like oh my god i get raw milk from nothing <laughs> <laughs> and like literally like i think i stopped talking to her like the next day but i was like i still go back there i'm like i love this place That's it tastes how milk is supposed to taste i've never had raw milk what describe it to me it's creamy as fuck no diddy <laughs> Us. it's creamy you made super fuck. intense eye contact when he said super creamy all right hey you're the one that has to lick my fucking staff wound so um you're the one creaming relax dude. <laughs> oh dude it's so good it's like i don't know it just tastes like yogurt no it's I, not that thick okay what about uh i guess it's, like it's half a, and half or you're cream? at kefir yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like brother. Oh, come on, look at me, brother. I, my <laughs> people, we have been kafir, brother. Okay, you know this, the, brother. Sorry, yeah, I, uh, I've been drinking that since I was a kid. That makes sense. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, because I'm so fucking manly looking. Hell yeah, yeah dude. Yeah, dude. You got a fucking thick ass beard. Yeah, that's, that's all I got. I got hair down here, but not hair up here, type of thing. I feel like that's the trade off. Yeah, me and my other Middle Eastern friend we were talking about that. It's like there's two types of brown. It's like hair up here and no hair down here, or like the inverse. Dude, I've got a. I'm the inverse. I've got a couple, but actually, my buddy that I, I'm, again, I'm 99 percent sure he's sick. He's a huge, he's sick as fuck. He's sick as fuck. Uh, he's a huge Indian dude. His name's Deepak. He's like my height. <laughs> that sounds like a big Indian dude name, bro. He's like Deepak. my height, but he's fucking like 270. Like he's a big boy, but he's got like a th- the thickest beard ever. Nice. Like full head of hair, whatever. Dude, he's got a cousin that has like no beard whatsoever i bet he could grow a beard but it's like i'm like how yeah. the fuck you got that amount of variance in the yeah. same family no there's there's a lot of that dude there's a i have family members who don't grow a lot of hair not like immediate family members but like in my like family like extended family okay and there's some that are like blonde hair blue eyes some that are red hair my dad has green eyes because he's kurdish oh hell yeah so kurds are like the northern iraq region and they're mixed with like russian and mongolian like the semi-autonomous wool desiring to be autonomous region. Kurdistan. Yeah. Dude. Kurdistan. Hell uh, yeah. I didn't see so like are you from like the north, like from Kurdistan? Uh so I'm from Kedkuk, which is yeah. uh northern Iraq. Mm-hmm. Were you in the military? No. Oh, okay. You just know about this shit? Dude, I followed a You're guy. You're a cultured ass white dude, man. I like that shit. I try to be. <laughs> I followed a guy on Instagram for the longest time. I don't know if he died or what, but he was a like a volunteer in the YPK. What's that? the fucking kurdish military oh that <laughs> like the you know you know recognized as a terrorist state yeah, by the united yeah, yeah. states yeah no he was like a member of like like a volunteer member i think he was like a u.s service member and then he got out but he had like kurdish descent or something and he like went to kirkuk to like fight against isis and like fought in kirkuk and mosul like against isis like while we had nothing to do with it and he was like posting videos on his fucking instagram of them like capturing isis people like it was a sick page that's crazy yeah I love that shit. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm from Kedekuk. That's like close to that area. I've like uh, my mom's from Kedekuk, and we're all born there except my dad. He was born in Edebil, and then uh, that's like the Kurdish region. That's like where it's in Kurdistan. Okay, um, that part's nice. Edebil is really nice. It's like malls, water parks, fucking amusement parks. Dude, I want to go. It's actually really cool. Uh, I don't know about right now, but uh, Kedekuk is not nice. It's like where all like the resources are, so they like strip it of its resources and the money goes to Edebil. What made your parents bail out? Um, I feel like I told the story a million times, but I'm gonna tell it. As Dude, it's interesting as, as fuck to me. That's okay, so cool. cool. No, you're fine. Um, so. Okay, so context. My dad was uh, like an anchorman in uh, in Iraq. Like, my family was pretty wealthy. I hate it because I was the only one who didn't experience the wealth. Mm-hmm. So I've just been broke my whole life. I don't even know better. You know what I mean? But they, uh, my mom was like an accountant. She had a good job. My dad was an anchorman. He had a good job on the news network. My brother was like, had his own TV show. He's like 10 years older than me. My sister is seven years older. Um, my brother had his own TV show on the news network. So like we were a very well-off family. Um, but the issue was my dad was like openly against Saddam and yeah, not great for your overall health and well-being. Um, so one morning, uh, my mom woke up, my dad was gone. 
and she was freaking out. And then Saddam's troops came to the front door, knock on the door, asked for my dad. She didn't know where he was. Uh, so they were like, all right, you got 24 hours to find him or we take you. So they left. My uncle called and was like, hey, the phones are tapped. I can't tell you what's going on, but I'm going to come get you. So then, uh, so I was a year old. My sister's eight, my brother's 11. And then my uncle comes and gets all of us. And then we go to northern Iraq, uh, like where the Turkey and the Iraq border is. And we're like staying there for like a month or two. Then we trek the border. Uh, and then once we pass the border, we meet my dad. And then we essentially just left everything behind. Um, and then we lived in Istanbul in like a studio apartment for like the five of us. And we we're like, pretty much had like $50. Like we had like really nothing to our name. And uh, we lived there for two years. So we went from like being really wealthy, having like house, like massive house and everything to just a studio apartment in uh, Istanbul. And then uh, that's where like my first life memories were. That's like my first like, uh, like memories. And after that, for two years, we lived there. Uh, an electrician came to like fix the house or whatever. And he was talking to my sister, asked her where we're from. She said Iraq. Um, he was like, oh, I bet you love Saddam. And she's like, no, I hate Saddam. He's an asshole. Try to kill my dad, blah, blah, blah. And then he said, you should be careful because Saddam has eyes and ears everywhere. And that's like what his agents would say. So my mom freaked out. We signed up for the United Nations Refugee Federation. And so I have family members who are like a bunch of us are refugees. So, okay, for context, my mom has 14 siblings. My dad has 29 siblings and a lot of them had kids, like a lot of kids. Like we have three of us. That's about the average, if not more. Um, so everybody kind of dispersed. So like some family went to Norway, some to Australia, some to Britain, um, Canada. But we went to Georgia because my sister had tuberculosis at the time. And Georgia and Iraq are apparently on like a similar latitude. So it had been better for her lung health. So we got pushed to the front of the line. Also, too, my parents are college educated. So that actually helped us. I, I just got really super lucky, to be honest. Like, it's kind of crazy. But we got pushed to the front of the line because tuberculosis in the college education. And we got put to Georgia. We were originally supposed to Clarkston, Georgia, which is like by Decatur where they sent all the refugees. I was about to say, that's like a huge refugee hub. Exactly. So <clears throat> I don't know what life would have been like there. But I grew up in Cartersville where that church sponsored us. So I was like the only Middle Eastern kid that wasn't a family member of mine that I knew of until like 17, 18 years old. There was another kid from Jordan. Uh, he was a refugee as well. And he he got sponsored by, I think, the the masjid in town. Like, uh, I think they helped his family get started here in America. But he was like the first person I'd met in the school system, like ever, that was Middle Eastern. And it was kind of crazy. I grew up as the only brown kid. So when I grew up and went to like college and like went to Atlanta and like meeting other Middle Eastern people was kind of crazy to me. Because I was like, I just grew up around, around like white people and black people. I was about to say, you grew up in, like, Redneckville, Georgia. Country as fuck, yep. Uh, but, I mean, I just kind of hung out whoever would hang out. I mean, most of my friends were black or Hispanic growing up. I was going to say, did you get fucked with them? I mean, I would imagine that's going to be a fucking... <laughs> yeah. That's so going to be a tough upbringing. You're, like, yeah. a young kid, like, in the aftermath. I was chubby. I talked a, a, a lot of shit. A young Iraqi kid <laughs> yeah. that's, like, seven in the aftermath of fucking 9-11. And yeah. we, like, invade and all of the U.S. media is like, oh, yeah. no, they're all evil. Dude, anytime we're in, like, history class and, like, we're going over, like, the, like, Iraq or the Middle East, it's like everyone just turns and looks at me like I'm the representative. And I'm like, brother, I don't know. I was raised here. So why did you do? this muhammad and you're like i literally fled the country don't yeah, look at me i'm like i don't know man fucking oil money that's why i did it dude the fucking cojones on your dad to be like on the news and be talking shit about saddam especially because didn't saddam straight up purge the parliament at one point where he like called some parliamentary meeting and then just started reading off names and they got walked out and executed probably sounds about right yeah he killed a lot of people he uh he tortured my uncle my uncle my mom's brother he like said in a private conversation to his friend that he didn't agree with Saddam and his friend rat him out for money. And then he got taken to like Saddam's torture chambers and got tortured for, I think like a few years. And then he came out and he ended up just dying just from all the stress. He was what like the never the fuck? same. Again. Yeah, no, it was super fucked up. Um, I mean, there were some people that were like, Oh, like at least when the Saddam's there, there's stability because when he got taken down, there was like a power vacuum. And I think like some people didn't think that far ahead, but I mean, I don't know, man. It's Fuck all... you, Dick Cheney. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it's just like it's hard to I, I'm really not that educated in politics, to be honest. So like it's hard for me to have like a uh, like a real opinion on stuff. But I think it's just hard to see like that far ahead. And it's hard to like also know like the true intentions behind like the powers that which be like why they do the things they do. Yeah. Um, and I think that's on purpose. Like, I don't think we're really meant to know the true agenda for why, like, you know, 
the powers that be the big guy upstairs you know what i mean yeah it's like hey shut up and go along with whatever we tell you is what's best for the country and don't ask too many questions because we know what's best for you yeah exactly so it's like what am i gonna do about it is that i guess i could vote i don't know (laughs) fuck voting dude (laughs) voting does not work um (laughs) just clip that and put it up by its own me saying voting doesn't work i'll have more angry people yeah um what uh was that kind of like what led you get what led you to get into jujitsu or what made you start you said you started when you were like 14 yeah so to be honest man i feel like i had like <laughs> like the more jujitsu people i meet the more i realize i'm really not that special it's like we all had the same like similar upbringing um yeah i was just like so i'm the youngest of three so like you're already getting fucked with like and if your siblings are seven and ten years older than you like they're beating your ass every time like there's no <laughs> there's no fair fight like i remember trying to beat my brother's ass when he's like 15 and i'm five it's like you know it's just pointless you got to do nothing but nut shots and run you know what i mean hell yeah you gotta do cheap shit but yeah so like you know i was already used to like rough housing growing up so like i i thought it was fun like I always like wrestled my friends and like you know enjoyed like the physical part of it but i didn't like the like i didn't like confrontation or like fighting like arguing people i guess maybe like when i was like a dumb kid maybe but for the most part no but uh and then, like, obviously, like, you know, if you're the only Middle Eastern kid in a post-9-11 world in a small country town, you're probably going to get fucked with. And that's fine. Um, and I think, like, a bit of that and then just, like, all right, well, I got to learn how to defend myself. I already kind of like fighting and martial arts. I always thought it was cool. I was really into pro wrestling. I'll never forget when I found out it was fake. It's like, fuck, dude. It's, it's like finding out saying it's not real. No, I always knew that shit wasn't real. Like, I remember being four years old in, like, pre-K and people trying to tell me about sand. I was like, Nah, dude, I don't buy that shit. I was always a skeptic. So I was like, I actually say that, but I'm super naive. But I always knew Santa was bullshit. I had a hunch. And then I asked my mom and she was like, yeah, it's bullshit. And I went to school and I told everybody and I got in trouble. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was you like, showed hey, up, you're like, I've got some news for you, motherfuckers. Yeah. You don't want to fuck with me. I'm about to ruin your whole world. <laughs> yeah. My mom said that's bullshit. Uh, yeah, my mom was like, I ah, fucked up. <laughs> but uh, I got a big mouth. Uh, but yeah, I guess just like classic stuff like that. It's like I was always into martial arts, into pro wrestling uh you know grew up an older sibling so you're just fighting that's just normal that's how it is you know um and yeah i got bullied so like you know you're just uh you kind of gravitate towards that line of thinking because like i wasn't really able to do other sports uh like my parents didn't really want to take me to like do other sports and then also too like i was born with a heart condition so like i wasn't able to like uh i was a chubby kid i was a fat boy really my mom was a lunch lady so like Hell i would yeah. just go straight back to the cafeteria after school just fucking i'd eat like eight lunches in a day dude Hell whatever's yeah. left over i'll eat it like you said you didn't drink milk growing up like from like 10 to whatever it's like bro i drank milk every day several times a day <laughs> until like 18 it's like just like if my if i got some at school i was drinking it and if my mom worked at the school which for a while she did I was drinking more. It was like me and like other lunch ladies kids and we're all like super fat and just drinking milk and eating nachos after school together. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I was like, you know, I was an easy target to fuck with. And it's like, you know, I was also probably just like a weird kid. You know what I mean? I'm weird now. So like uh, it was probably just easy to fuck with me. So I just got into karate when I was like probably like 10. But it was just like I only did that because there was no jujitsu around and I didn't really know what I was looking for. Um, and I did that for a few years, but it was kind of lame because there's no sparring. And that was like the part I really wanted to do. This is the part you see in the movies. You're like, all right, let's fight each other. Let's see what it's like for real. And then, uh, eventually it's a funny story. It was like, I think in eighth grade or something like that, eighth grade, maybe ninth grade. Uh, one of my buddies, he was like the kid in the school system that trained MMA for real. Like he's wearing Ed Hardy shirts, tap out shirts, yeah. shirts. He would like go to like Vegas. His dad was really into it. So like he would go to Vegas and train with like Gray Maynard and stuff like that back in the day. Holy shit. Yeah. This is like back when Gray Maynard was like a big deal. The you know fucking I mean? man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he's still the man. But uh, it was just like in that era of like 2008, 2009. And uh, I knew he had trained, but I didn't really know where because there wasn't a gym nearby. And then we were like in the back of like chemistry class one day and we were like kind of shooting the shit. And I was so dumb. I had like watched grappling videos and like stuff online, just like whatever I could find on YouTube or on Google. And I saw someone do what's called an executioner. You know what that is? No. An executioner is like, imagine I go around you and grab your neck from behind like a guillotine, but I'm behind you and I bend your neck backwards like that. What the fuck? It's, it's named after uh, Scotty Epstein. This guy uh, is 10 playing a black belt, but it's called Executioner. And I thought that was a guillotine. And I was like, dude, watch this fucking guillotine I learned online. He was like, that's not a guillotine. And then he put me in like just a classical like deep guillotine. 
and he like almost put me to sleep because I didn't really know how to tap. I was like, I didn't really like understand like how fast it would come on and like how quickly I needed to tap. And he almost like put me to sleep and I was like, dude, that was fucking sick. And he was like, yeah. And then he slid me this address of like where he trained and it was just this guy's like house and he had like a basement gym. It's like this older guy who was just really into it. His son trained. Hell yeah. And there's just a local pro fighter who taught there and it's just me and like a bunch of teenagers. And I was like the grunt of them all because I had trained the least. I was the youngest. I was like the least athletic and I got the absolute shit kicked out of me like MMA training for a little bit. And then a gym finally opened up in town where that local fighter was teaching at. Went there and then just kind of went down the MMA path for a little bit. And then after a few years of that, I was like, this is actually terrible. What am I doing this for? Um, just from like concussions, knee injury. It's just like, it's like, if you're not going to be John Jones, like why do this? Um, so I just stuck to jujitsu. Did and you ever then, fight in MMA? I did, but <laughs> not then. I, uh, I got injured on my 18th birthday. Like I tore my ACL really bad and I was out of training for a few months. Um, thankfully I was young and I didn't need surgery. So, um, it wasn't like a complete tear. It was like a really bad grade too. Like someone went for her eye goshi on me yeah. on like hip toss. And then when they went to reap my leg, instead of making me light, they made me heavy and oh, they sat. Yeah. And he was also like 300 pounds and I'm like 170 pound, like child. Good. <laughs> Great. Right. Perfect. And we're doing MMA, like sparring, like shark tank drills. So like, I'm just getting the shit kicked out of me oh by a grown man. <laughs> <laughs> all right and uh ua 170 he weighs 300 yeah shark tank him yeah he's, exactly. he's had three rounds in a row go get him <laughs> yeah dude i just got my ass beat it was great but uh yeah he kicked my leg out and uh my knee just i watched it like just pop out of place and go like completely backwards and like to the side and uh even my coach at the time he was like always really hard on me and even then he was like "Ooh, that looked really bad <laughs> and he didn't want to say it but he's just like oh you okay and i'm like no i don't think i am but after that i was like I took some time off, came back, and I was like, yeah, I think I'm just going to do, just do jujitsu because it's a lot easier on my body. Because I was like, I want to keep training for the rest of my life. I don't want to, like, have a – I'd rather, like, train in the long term and do less, I guess, like, accolade-wise than win a bunch of stuff. But then I'm injured, and then I can't train. Like, I feel like there's really no – maybe, I don't know, maybe this is why I suck as a competitor. But it's like – like, maybe this is why I don't win shit. But it's like I don't want to – give up my quality of life for a medal or even like i don't know how much money would be worth it even a million dollars it's like that sounds nice but then like after tax and all that shit it's like is it really worth not being able to walk for the rest of your life properly i don't know i was gonna say a lot of people i mean there's people that are maimed or like not gonna walk normally for the rest of their life for far less money you uh you had a match with tyson right yeah we tyson did B. i watched him snap a kid's ankle mm -hmm. when he was I remember what that. Yeah, it was at an AGF or something like yes. that. Yes. Yeah, I was there. I saw it. I was standing right there. I was like, I think I we was coaching someone right next to him. To and then I looked over and then I was like, oh, God. And I think I saw it right before it broke, too. And it seemed like I remember thinking like, man, I feel like he's been in this for a while. And I was – every time I think this person should tap, <laughs> the leg almost always explodes. And it's like, oh, no. I was I was literally standing right there watching it happen. Yeah. It was like from me to that palm tree, like right there was yeah. the distance. And literally the kid was like laughing at some of Tyson's leg entries. And it was like 12 seconds left. And he got a straight <sighs> ankle. And I saw Tyson roll over. I was like, this kid's about to get his fucking ankle popped. And I thought – I didn't think it was going to be that. And it literally sounded like a fucking baseball bat. And he then broke kid, the leg leg, right? Uh-huh. The tip fib, right? Oh, yeah. That's actually a lot more common than people think because it's like if someone gets the right enough angle and they – because it was a straight ankle lock, right? Yeah, belly right. down, straight ankle. Yeah, I mean, you're essentially just doing a deadlift against someone's tib fib. And if you twist their ankle enough to where it's mechanically weak and you can't fight against it, it's like, I don't know, man. Do you really want to play that? I've felt people who are like, even if they're not doing it right, they're just bridging into your tib fib. And it's like, yeah, you'll probably break my leg. <laughs> like, you yeah. got it, dude. <laughs> like, like you're, not even, worth it. you're not even doing it right. You're like belly up, but you're so strong and you're so dense that it's like, I don't want to take that risk and just fuck around and find out, dude for a fucking four dollar plastic medal from yeah that's crazy American to get broken Federation. to get broken at like a like essentially amateur grappling scenario where there's no money on the line for me even like putting like a bunch of money on the line it's like i don't know it's like i'm gonna blow through a lot of uber eats money real fast how and like, still have a broken leg yeah like what qu quantify how much money your leg functioning for the rest of your life is worth is it 10 grand like you're gonna have to pay me a fuckload more than ten thousand dollars for me to be like yeah snap it yeah 
the like brandon was uh talking one time and he was like i've seen so many tournaments where guys getting fucking leg shootouts and it's first and second place on a podium and number one has ice on their knee and number two has ice on their knee because both of them popped each other yeah exactly and like there's i think there's a difference between like a pop and it's like a catastrophic break yeah. because like i've been popped before and it's like oh that sucks but like I'm also like aware enough to know like when it's a pop and it's like, all right, I'm stuck and this is going to just snap my whole leg. Let me just go ahead and tap and not take exorbitant damage for no reason. Yeah. So guys will let their shit pop for literally nothing. I know Campbell. people will let their shit pop in training. I know people who will just eat breaks in training. And I'm like, what's wrong with like, you? Why? Like, yeah. And like there's accidents like, you know, things happen. Like I've definitely had issues where like it was coming on. And I was like, all right, I need a tap. And like as I'm going to tap, I tap and then my foot pops and it's like, damn. And it's like, that's annoying, but like, that's just kind of like, that happens every now and then it's like, you waited just half a second too long. And like, you also like underestimate the time it takes for you to tap their brain to register. And then for them to let go, it's like, it's a longer time than you'd imagine. And it's like, sometimes you're like, you're also like basing off of one hand, trying to like lift your hips up and alleviate the pressure. So like I'll verbal tap a good bit if I feel like I just, I can't get to my hands in time, but I verbally tapped like a bitch. Like la the, actually, the training session before I got staff against Brady because he got onto my leg yeah. and I was like tap 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 <laughs> like fucking because oh, yeah. it was like he like fell back on it. He had a fucking good bite and I was like, yeah. please don't, please don't. Yeah, it's like it's hard not to sound, I guess, like that when you verbal tap. It's all I mean, it's immediate. It's like da da da. <laughs> it's like, you can't sound cool. You're like tap. You know what I mean? Like, no, it's like your gonna break. <laughs> you're trying to get out tap before yeah. you it's feel like, your fucking I'm, knee become yeah. This is the last ditch effort. I must tap as soon as possible. <laughs> that shit is oh my god yeah the foot tap always makes me laugh though i always tell students like you know if your hands are busy just verbal tap if you can't verbal tap for whatever reason i guess you could foot tap but like damn dude if you got a foot tap also too it almost takes me a second to understand that that's a tap yeah 100 <laughs> percent. and too it takes way longer because if you're gonna tap <laughs> yeah. with your foot it's not just like a tap it's like you gotta hike your fucking leg, leg up, up and slam it like twice yeah before the other person's like oh i think they're tapping because like i don't know if you're in a if you're on the mats and the mats are like kind of that's a very good point kind of occupied and yeah. like someone gets swept and like lands like it sounds like the same like that sounds more of like tap than a foot tap yeah and you're tapping on the floor which is also inherently dangerous true yeah what's the worst you've ever hurt someone in a grappling match <sighs> i'm trying to think in a match or like in training either <laughs> uh fuck all right, so I guess I have two that I can think of off the top of my head. One was in a competition. This one I really felt bad for, but, like, I gave him so much time to tap and even stopped after the first pop, and he, like, still refused to tap. That's on him. It was on him, and I still just felt bad because he was, like, I was, like, a blue belt. It's, like, a new breed. I'm, like, pretty young. I think I'm, like, 19 or 20 at the time. And he, uh, I put him in a triangle, and he does the thing where he like does this, I guess, like answering the phone. And I was like, "Cool, I guess I could triangle this, but I really want a wrist lock." So I grabbed, <laughs> dude. This is honestly <laughs> really fucked. I'm a bully, but uh, I get this wrist lock, and it's like kind of like one of the worst ones in my opinion. It's like this one straight oh, back, yeah. Because I feel like most people have a little more range of motion this way yeah, forward. Your, your shit doesn't go anywhere going backwards. Yeah, not mine at least. Um, and this dude's like older. He's like in his late 30s 40s maybe and he's in the adult division and i know him because we've cross trained together before and his like wife and his kid are there and i'm like applying it and it pops and i'm like you okay and he's like yeah i'm good man that was just air and i was like i don't really think that was air but <laughs> okay watch this <laughs> i was like i don't know if you can pop air out of your wrist by the way <laughs> like straight back i was like i've never popped my wrist straight back buddy to like get some air out of there but <laughs> i was like all right and then I kept applying it. And then it was just like, oh, man, it was so gross because his like I felt the tension and the give. And it was the give that was like really gross for me because I felt his knuckles go back this way oh. and like go limp. And I like immediately let off. And it was like not just like a pop. It was like it sounded like cardboard tearing or like yeah. really like a loud crunch and like almost dude, almost like a carpet tearing. It was just so like thick, like the amount of like uh like i guess like bone and like ligament had to tear through uh i don't know exactly what the damage was but i stopped immediately and i was like you okay and he goes no i'm not and i was like yeah dude jesus christ and like yeah and then uh, i saw him like a few months later i think maybe like five or six months later i had a tournament and he had a cast on his arm and i was like dude don't tell me that's from 
that wrist lock? And he's like, it is. I think he had to get surgery because your wrist is like such a terrible thing to break because it's like you have like 13 little bones that fit perfectly in one another. Um, so if you fuck up one thing, it's like I've popped my wrist in like a wrist lock and didn't tap fast enough. And then like my wrist was like felt funky for a while. So mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine like because I think you had to get like pins and screws and all that shit because I think it like definitely tore some stuff, but it might have like dislocated or like fucked up the bones or to some degree. I don't know. I don't know how an anatomy works, but uh, he had to get surgery and he was out of training for a while. He was in a sling like five months later still. Just tap. It just tap, dude. It was a new breed tournament. We're blue belts. Multiple questions. One, <laughs> why are you in the adult division yeah. as a 30 something year old man at a new breed? He was two, definitely like closer to 40. Two, why are you bringing your kid? <laughs> Don't bring your kid. You, like, dude, I'll see MMA fighter. Like, okay, have you ever seen that video of Kamaru Usman's daughter when he gets fucking obliterated? No. Dude, there is a video where Kamaru gets head kicked to hell by Leon and his daughter's in the crowd. Oh, man. Like, dude, you just traumatized that little girl. Yeah, that's fucked. It's, it's not as bad for grappling tournaments, but like in striking where you can get knocked out and it's like everybody sees that and they're like, ooh, that's bad. Like you look dead. Whereas like in grappling tournaments, you just tap. People who don't even know what's going on half the time are like, oh, what happened? You know what I mean? Especially like a wrist lock. If you tap. If you tap. If you don't <laughs> I was tap, about to say the know caveat being if you fucking tap. Yeah, and if you, if you don't, don't tap. tap, people hear the pop and go, that didn't sound good. Yeah, it's probably pretty traumatic hearing your father's arm break in front of you dude i uh i've told the story literally on this because i ask everyone that does jujitsu the same question mm -hmm. just because i have a fucking sadistic mind um my mom w went to, i've competed once my mom insisted on going i mm -hmm. begged her not to she got <laughs> caught in an americana and tried to roll out of it wait who you did no a guy like right before my match oh like the mat over from where i was she saw so my get broke off my mom was like standing there waiting for me to go up and i was like sitting there and i was like i don't want her here like this is whatever dude he got I, I, okay actually i think uh tristan is the one that told me about it tristan and ryan crook were there mm -hmm. and um yeah they like had like walked over to me and i had like my headphones on and i could just hear the crack and i like looked up and the dude was like screaming yeah apparently he got caught in an americana and was like i should roll yeah because he thought it was a kimura i guess gotcha white belt and then my mom walked over and he's like i liked it better when you played baseball <laughs> I, was like, I told you not to come to this like you should not be here yeah i've never had parents uh come to uh, a jujitsu match or anything like that yeah that's probably for the best yeah i mean it's okay i don't i don't want to have to worry about them being there you know what i mean i think it's way better that way yeah i just want to do my thing yeah it's like please just let me go do this and yeah exactly and whatever um and then i'm trying to think uh probably one of the worst breaks i've ever felt was uh ah oh, this is such a fuck story this is, uh i used to teach at this gym in the atlanta area i don't want to say where but i uh i was teaching a class and this guy came in and i immediately got weird vibes from him like he apparently showed up like three hours early to class and he was like yo i'm here to train i'm, I'm here to learn he kept saying the same thing over and over again which is gonna is gonna make sense in, in a little bit but he uh he showed up and he was in the class. I got a weird vibe from him and I asked him, I was like, Hey man, like, have you trained before? He goes, Hey, I've trained. And I was like, where, where have you trained at? And then he goes, where have I not trained? And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and then he just kept saying, I want to learn. I'm here to learn over and over again to everyone. And I was like, is this dude tripping on something right now? And, uh, I rolled with him first round cause I didn't want to roll the students. And I was like, let me just kind of feel this dude out real quick. And, uh, I put him in Ashi and he grabs my wrapping hook. So the foot like on the hip, he goes to like grab like an, a, an Aoki lock essentially and tries to like rip it. And I just kind of go with it. And then when uh, I go with it, I expose his heel for the outside heel hook. And where we're here, he keeps going to like <laughs> go for the Aoki lock away. But my foot's fine. And I have the outside heel gets pinned. Everything's there. I have the entanglement. And I lock my hands and I'm like, I'm going super slow. And I like just slowly apply pressure to see, cause he said he's trained before. And, uh, right when I thought, man, crazy, most people tap right about here. And right when I thought that his leg just exploded and it was like a pop, pop. It was like the several pops. Sound like Velcro ripping. Yeah. And I felt it radiate up from his foot all the way up to the knee. Like I, I could, I saw the tension in his knee and I was like, man, it's crazy. Like most people tap right about here. But he was really gun ho on this Aoki that he was going for. And, uh, and uh, yeah, when I felt it go, I stopped immediately. And I was like, dude, are you okay? And he gets up and he goes, whoo. And he like gets up and he's like, whoo, I feel good, man. Let's keep going. And I was like, what? And like, 
I was like, is your leg okay? He, he kind of like limps a little bit, but he's still moving. And I'm like, all right, let's keep rolling then, I guess. And then uh, he kept saying that sa- that thing, like, oh, I'm just here to learn, dude. I'm just here to learn. And I was like, this dude's definitely on some shit right now because I most definitely just snapped that leg. And uh, he was definitely on like PCP or something because when I tell you he was the strongest human being I have ever felt Dude, there was a moment where I was on top of him in Mount. And I just like put him down, held him down. I was like, all right, what am I going to do with this guy? <laughs> like, this is a long, how long is this round? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then uh, I like have my hands on the ground in Mount and I'm just kind of thinking. And he grabs my wrist like a C grip and he just gets up and essentially does like a hip bump sweep, but like from bottom Mount. And when he grabbed my wrist, I tried to like pummel and like circle. And it felt like he was almost going to like break my bones with his grip. This dude's like 150. He's a skinny guy. Like I outweigh him. And he didn't seem like he was like super in shape, seemed like a pretty like skinny dude, but it was ungodly strength. And I've done jujitsu long enough to roll with like really strong people who are on all the steroids. And this did not even feel like steroids. This just felt like crack or PCP type shit, like crazy type of strength. Like when he would squeeze, I would see like the strenuations, strenations, yeah, striations, striations, yeah. striations, yeah, in his arms. And uh, it just looked like unnatural to the point where I was like, I feel like he's. Cause you know, like uh, when people do PCP or shit like that, they like, no, <laughs> you, know, you never do that. No, no I've never really uh, <laughs> fucked with PCP. That's so. the key to, to winning, dude. That's a new PED, but it's, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's like, I, I've, this is what I've heard from like friends who are police officers or like in the medical field that like, and I could be butchering this, but like it like disrupts your neuromuscular system in the sense of like, it makes you fire off all those muscle like uh, contractions but your nervous system can't regulate it. So it's doing it so much that you're almost like tearing your own muscle fibers, squeezing so hard. Like the next day you're going to feel like shit because like how hard you squeeze because your body can't regulate it. That's what I understand to some degree, but dude, it's okay. We don't fact check anything. Perfect. Thank God. No, <laughs> but uh, bro science, just trust me, dude. Exactly. Source, so, just trust me. <laughs> source me. Yeah. I am the source. <laughs> and I just remember looking at his arm while he was squeezing my wrist and sitting up. And I was like, dude, this is not normal. This is not natural. Cause I've, I felt really strong dudes. I wrote with like Tex Johnson. This is one of the strongest human beings I've ever felt in my life. This dude felt stronger than that. Didn't make sense. And then uh, I was kind of like in fight or flight mode. And I was like, damn, I got to get this dude down now. Because he like started to get up and got back up. And I like shoved him back down, got to mount. He's like freaking out. And he keeps saying, I, I just want to learn. I just want to learn. He's like talking to himself. And I'm like, have him in mount. And I like, <laughs> I like put him in what's called stocks in, uh, in 10 planet terms. It's like you weave that arm behind their shoulder and like pin them. So they're like this and mount. Yeah. And I'm like holding his wrist above his head and he's like still talking to himself. And I'm like, bro, who are you talking to? Like, I'm not responding at all right now. You're just talking to yourself. And he's like, what, man? Like, what the f-? And he starts freaking out and like he almost like snapped back to his senses. <laughs> and he's like calling me a bitch. And like, he's like, get the fuck off me. Like, I, I'm fucking tired of this shit, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what's going on, dude? And then like <laughs> he gets up and then like he's like, no, nah, man, let's keep going. And then we keep going. And then I get him in an ankle lock on the same leg and I go belly down and I just like, dude, I pop it again. It's like, I think I just popped a different part of his ankle and just kept breaking his leg. What and the then, fuck? And then he, <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I let him up. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, after that ankle lock, he like, he tried to tap, but he, I guess he didn't know how to tap properly. He's like, all right, all right, all right. And I was like, what? I was like, are you tapping? He's like, yeah let go. And I was like, let go. And he's like, I'm tired of this shit. And he gets up and freaks out. He like cusses me out in front of the whole class. And like, after the first break on the heel hook, like several of my students around me were looking and were like, yo, what the fuck is going on? And then, uh, he gets up and he leaves. Sorry. I didn't mean to touch your foot. Oh no, that wasn't me. That was the, uh, oh, man, I wish it was your foot. It'd be nice. Okay, it's play. a traumatic moment. We, I need to touch somebody. Well, but, okay. uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm here for you. Don't worry. Appreciate it. Uh, he gets up and walks away and everyone's like, what the fuck just happened? And then the crazy part was he walked back and he was like holding something in his hand and we we're like oh fuck dude we're about to die we're about to get shot up and he's like <laughs> to air the gym out yeah exactly and then he comes back and he's like i forgot my shirt and then he's like grabs the shirt walks past me and he's like you still a bitch and he like walks off <laughs> and everyone's like what does that happen i'm like i don't know dude that was crazy and then this is <laughs> the really funny part because i think the next day he finally realized how fucked his leg was because the gym page uh, the gym that I worked at, at the time, I didn't even run their Instagram page. The uh, the owner showed me, but like 
there was like a string of like burner accounts just like sending like story replies of like the gym's like posted videos of people working out or whatever. And he's like responding to it, just talking shit. And like the first couple of messages, he's like, who is this guy? And then the third message, he's like, you broke leg bitches. Like, fuck y'all. Like, and then we're like, oh, it was that guy. Like he probably just woke up the next day and realized like how destroyed his leg really was. Cause I broke it two separate times on the same leg, just like one internally, one externally. So it's like, I just broke both sides of his leg completely. And uh, I was just trying to balance it out, bro. Yeah. I was helping him out. You know what I mean? Uh, but that's yeah. a learning experience. I mean, I got to test my breaking mechanics, so that was kind of cool. Like, I always hate hurting people, but in that case, where it's like, I oh, kind of did it to himself and he's kind of a dick, and it's like, all right, well, at least I know I can break someone's leg. Because, like, imagine I trained all this time and I still couldn't break someone's leg if I really needed to. It's kind of crazy. So, I've got an idea. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't like where this is going. So, I've got an idea. <laughs> so, you run a gym. Okay. Yeah. We were talking about belt qualifications. <laughs> yeah. The old school thing was like, hey, look, if you want to be a blue belt, you got to know how to apply <laughs> jujitsu. I already know to where going. defend yourself. Look, this guy needs money for PCP. You've got white belts that need to show that they're about it. Yeah. You just pay him and you're like, look, bro, I'll give you a hundred bucks a week for PCP. How ex is PCP expensive? I'm not sure. You don't know? I mean, I didn't ask this guy. I brought you here to be a subject matter expert. <laughs> this is very disappointing. Uh, <laughs> you you go, look, bro, I'll pay you 100 bucks a week. If you just come in and anytime I need to promote someone, like I think they're like right on the, on the precipice. That's the test. You take that $100, you get to ride the high of your life, and this white belt has to restrain you and not – die okay so alliance did there's whole... like a liability waiting to happen everyone signs a waiver it's okay but they uh, have to get on my mats i gotta get this fucking crackhead on my mats stop, and like stop, they're stop. probably you're, you're thinking logically <laughs> <laughs> shut that shit Just out go ahead and stop that so alliance did that like brown belt like fight for black belt thing how bad do you want a blue belt wait what is what what do they do I don't, i'm not sure sorry alliance, i've never done a belt test to be honest or like been a part of one so i only I don't know understand. of one gym in atlanta that does them i know creighton does blue belt tests Okay. I but don't know. What's this brown to black belt test? It wasn't a test. So apparently Alliance put on like a t an in-house brown belt tournament. And it was like, if you won the tournament, you got a black belt. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. That's awesome. So I'm just stealing their idea. Thank you, Rick. And <laughs> Wait, who won? I don't know. Damn. So Nobody okay. remembered his name. Shit. Let's find out. Let's find out who won. So but Rick put it on? I think, I mean, I saw Rick posting about it. I know Rick's one of the instructors there. When did this happen? I feel like I missed this. Dude, this was like two weeks ago, I think. Oh, wow. This is new. Let me see here. Um, is it only Alliance Brown Belts? Can yeah, I, brown belt on, I think it was only Alliance Brown Belts. You think if I just pull up, put a gi on? I'm just kidding. You should have. <laughs> you should have been like, I want a black belt. You I look just, at me. I, I, I am Alliance now. That'd be hilarious. I am Alliance Black Belt now. You Fuck, win and you're like, actually, it? I don't even want the belt. I just wanted to take it from somebody else. I just wanted to ruin someone's day. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even do this to win. I just do it to ruin the day of others. There was someone who did that... Uh, uh, it was at 10 Planet. There was somebody, like, there was a tournament for a Craig Jones seminar ticket. Oh, it was Elijah. <laughs> Elijah went into the tournament, and he already had a ticket. He just wanted to, like, fuck with somebody. He ended up fighting Ryan at the end. Ryan got the ticket, but it was just really funny that Elijah made it all the way to the finals. <laughs> already had a ticket. That's insane. Yeah. Alliance Kumite. Um, That's sick. That's a good name. Mauricio Filho. This gentleman. Oh, he won? Yeah. I feel like I know who that is, maybe. Maybe it was him. Oh, wait. Or Leo Noguera? Well, he's the coach. No, definitely not Leo Noguera. <laughs> That'd be fucked if like, he was in the tournament. Second. No yeah, one's so getting promoted this time. This uh, gentleman, Mauricio, won. Okay. Yeah, so I feel like I may that. know who he is, but uh, good on him, dude. Anyways, you want a blue belt test. <laughs> this is the solution. This is great publicity. Yeah. You can film the whole thing. Fantastic content. White great belt content. versus PCP head. White belt versus crackhead. We got to give him crack just to make the content. Like, the, the headline's got to... It's got to gotta kind of roll off the tongue. PCP head. Yeah, that doesn't flow. That was a terrible yeah. idea on my end. Crackhead. My end. Yeah. White belt versus crackhead for blue belt. <laughs> yeah. That would do I, great. I'd probably recommend not having him smoke the crack on uh, Kazushi Club grounds. That might get you in some trouble. Yeah, yeah. I don't think uh, the landlord would appreciate that. If you were in Portland, you could probably do that. Yeah, in Portland, just, I'm just taking my medicine, bro. Chill. Dude, this is my therapeutic. This is my therapeutic <laughs> dose of heroin right here. <laughs> No, officer. This is medicinal crack cocaine. <laughs> Don't worry. Just mind your business. This is for my job. <laughs> I'm sure there is some crackhead who's probably doing great at like a call center. He's just like getting hella sales. I think I actually watched a documentary about that. There's like, uh, I forgot what it's called, but it's about a call center. And it was like kind of like a scam. They would like scam older people. They would call them because, you know, older people are just, I guess, easy to scam. And yeah. then uh, 
they would call them and be like, hey, like I'm here with the police organization, whatever the fuck. They would just give some bullshit name. Like they were with some police something. And it's like, oh, we'd appreciate your donation. And like they get a sticker. And it's like they actually had nothing to do with the police. And they kept like 90% of the money. And they lied about their profit share and all this stuff. And it's like they made so much money. And the documentary was like about the people who worked there. And there was just so many people who were just like off the streets, just like drug addicts who would just sell like crazy. One dude was actually on heroin. And he was like dozing off in between calls, but he was like their number one salesman. And it's like, how does he do it? That's America, dude. I, I mean, that's, that's that, there's nothing more American. He than was, that. I think he was Indian, but yeah, I get the idea. All right, well, yeah. well, that's even more American, <laughs> that, dude. Exactly. H yeah. one B visa <laughs> to number one seller at a call center for a borderline fraudulent philanthropy cause yeah yeah dude i love that shit that's america yeah that is america <laughs> i like it dude that's what i'm here for <laughs> god damn that's fucking crazy i don't know i'm just th thinking about the dude on fucking pcp oh the guy who's like fucking his... broke off twice uh he broke himself off twice i feel like um but i was the catalyst <laughs> for the break he wanted it you were just giving him what he really he asked for what it. he yes we're victim blaming we can't do that I'm going to victim blame the guy on PCP. Yeah, like, exactly. yeah, bro, that's on you. Yeah. Like, don't do PCP if you don't want to get your shit. Don't do PCP and show up to a jujitsu school. Yeah, definitely also, don't. Also, when this thing stops, I want to know what school that was. Okay, Just I'll tell you. Curiosity sake. Okay, I'll tell you. Uh, but, yeah, it's uh, those are probably two of the worst breaks. That wrist lock on a, a Masters 5 opponent and then uh, <laughs> and then breaking off a crackhead with a heel hook um, and an ankle lock, too, technically. But... Yeah, honestly, I haven't really, like, hurt too many people, like, catastrophic breaks. Like, I feel like a lot of times when I compete and if I finish someone with a joint lock, a lot of times I do get a pop or two. But, like, they usually are just, like, it's a mix of, like, they don't want to tap and then I have to actually apply it competition speed because it's, like, I don't want you to escape. So I've had that happen, too, <laughs> where I armbarred someone and the ref didn't see it and the ref made me keep going. And then I armbarred him again on the same arm, same way. And I, like, I damn near had to break his arm because he didn't want to tap and i'm like looking at the referee to make sure like he knows that like i'm just gonna have to finish this all the way but thankfully they didn't let their arm break but yeah it's just like it's it's different in a competition like you have to apply it with the intention of breaking it if they don't tap that's kind of the whole thing it sounds fucked up to say out loud but everyone's doing it everyone's doing it all the cool kids are breaking limbs <laughs> it's not peer pressure it's just your turn <laughs> yeah exactly it's just yeah i don't know man it's just i understand like i've definitely been popped in tournaments and it's like you know i don't want to get catastrophically broken so i'm just gonna tap it's kind of on you at that point i was gonna say you're you're making the conscious decision to let that happen do you know yeah. rachel lamb by chance uh i think i do she trains uh i think now she trains it um fuck what's it called god damn it does she do photography yes. yeah, yeah okay yeah. she shoots all the pictures and she um i'm god, really bad with names god but. damn it it's just, I, I can't fucking think of the uh american top team mm -hmm. she trains at like att now and her and i were talking about how normalized it is like in the jiu-jitsu community to be like oh yeah my elbow got popped oh yeah this got this happened oh yeah that happened like talking about getting popped in training or in a competition if you tell that to any person that is not in jiu-jitsu they look at you like you should be on a watch list yeah, it's definitely, like, not the best culture in that sense. I feel like I definitely don't want to get popped, and I definitely don't – I kind of feel like an idiot if I get popped in training. I feel like it's my fault, you know what I mean, if I let it get there, unless it's, like, someone who's just inherently dangerous, like, we're training with a fucking Paul Harris type of guy who's just gripping and ripping in training. But, like, if I'm training with someone who's pretty controlled and I still get popped, then it's, like, I feel like an idiot because that was my fault. But, yeah, I do know what you mean. It's, like, there's a lot of, like, glorification almost in, like, injuries in jujitsu. Yeah, that part's dumb. Yeah, no, it's dumb that's, as fuck. That's very stupid. Like an egotistical, like, yeah, I just let that shit break. It's like, why? Like, no, you, that's dumb. You lost either way. You could have lost and brushed your teeth tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. You got to live to fight another day type shit. And I think that's very, very true because if you want to do this for the rest of your life and also have a good quality of life, because I've had injuries that like affected my quality of life and it's like, bro, this sucks. There's really, I don't know if there's anything like monetary or accolade wise worth my quality of life. No. So... I got my lab I tore my labrum. I trained at like a hole in the wall MMA school in Auburn, Alabama for three months. So like what can go wrong? And within three months I got my labrum popped. Yeah. And the guy caught me in like a fucking like inverted triangle from like side control or some shit and he caught it weird. I don't even remember what happened. I wow. was like a brand new white belt. Didn't know what the fuck was going on. Yeah. And he like caught it and squeezed and I just felt my shoulder like shift across my face. Yeah. And like my arm felt like it was on fire. Yep. I had torn this one playing baseball so I knew the exact feeling yeah. and I was like, I just tore my labrum. 
fuck like i'm yeah. about to have to get surgery on this thing and it's like yeah you fucking don't sleep for two weeks and yep. fucking have to deal with like a nerve block being like woven into your shoulder and it's like yeah. a whole thing you're like this is not worth it yeah no it never really is right i've torn my labor and forward it sucks it's not worth it like having your shoulder dislocate just random shit and you're like brother sucks like yeah. can't brush my teeth like for a while i couldn't drive with my right arm for a while just because like i would like put my arm up and like it would just start to get that fire feeling and yeah. i'm like all right i have to switch arms and shit like that so yeah it's not worth it man i uh i would say maybe the worst injury that i've had was like i got my face broken i got caught with a heel to the face out of a single leg that was pretty bad that's like sucked right then and there and sucked for a while out of a single leg you were on the single leg and i was caught on it? the leg and okay. i had like a two-on-one single yeah but like a burrito grip almost okay i was being nice and i was like should i golf swing the fuck out of this dude because he was kind of going really hard yeah and then I didn't. And then he tried to like front flip or like roll out of it. And his heel came out from the side and uh, broke my sinus bone and then cracked my orbital. And that sucked. I couldn't train for a few months because of that. And it's like scary, too, because I do a lot of passing where my head goes down. Mm -hmm. And it's like, bro, if you just broke your face, it is very scary putting your head back down there because yeah. you can just catch a knee. And then like my first day training again, I caught an elbow and it hit me right in the point where it broke. And I fucking was freaking out because... I didn't want it to re-break and whatnot, but that sucked. The injury that I've probably dealt with the most, but I didn't even know about it at the time, and this sounds terrible. I sound like a psychopath, but I broke my collarbone years ago. Didn't know, and it healed incorrectly. So look at this side of my collarbone and see how it's like flat. Yeah. And now look at this side of my collarbone and see how it's like almost perpendicular. Yeah, it's fucking bunched up there. Yeah, so that's the bone healing like this and it broke and i i guess i just didn't know but how the fuck you not know you broke your collarbone <laughs> I don't know. apparently it doesn't hurt anytime someone tells me they broke their collarbone i was like you took time off you pussy no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> i didn't even <laughs> you, notice you bro. were about it yeah no i'll stub my toe and be like oh fuck <laughs> i'm gonna be for a week <laughs> but uh yeah i didn't even like under i didn't even know i have a theory about like when maybe it was like in like a hard training session i like got like uh sat down weird but um yeah, I didn't even know. And then I went to a physical therapist years later and they asked me, like, when did I break my collarbone? And I was like, I never broke my collarbone. And they were like, no, you definitely broke that shit. Like, look at it. And then I got an x-ray and they were like, yeah, it broke like years ago. And I asked them, like, was I born that way? And they're like, no, like the way it's set up, it's like it was a few years ago. Like it had to have been like fairly recently. Like full on, like recalcified, like your bone grew back. Fucked yeah. Up. And now the really weird part is like, so you see how this part there's like this muscle right here yeah that's not normal my body grew an extra muscle just to adapt like and scar tissue or it's a muscle i don't know if it's like it's like a mutation or some shit I mean, if off you of touch it it's like muscle or like tendon and it connects and pulls it in and uh i haven't gotten an mri so i don't know exactly what it looks like but like i've had like physical therapists look at me and i've had like several and almost all of them are like i've never seen shit like that that's insane like your body shouldn't be doing that but I guess I just ignored it long enough. I was just probably like, oh, my shoulder kind of hurts. And then just ignored it and just kept training. And then my body just eventually adapted. My body was like, all right, this fucking lunatic is going to sit here and Went keep putting us through this full shit. full David Goggins mode. Stay hard, motherfucker. Stay hard, dude. My shoulder hurts, but it's hard. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. I, I don't understand, like, how that works anatomically. But, yeah, you just fucking... Just make some shit up, dude. Yeah, my body just fucking mutated, I guess. It's yeah. like, that's that's what the physical therapist told me. They're like, it's like a mutation muscle. It's like a mute muscle. Like, we've never seen that. That's not normal. I mean, it's got to be where your body's like, all right, well, this shit's just going to be stuck here. So we got to figure out some way to glue it in place. All yeah. right. And like some muscle that ties into it just fucking, it's like, a, like a river getting curved or some shit. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, we'll just, instead of going here, we'll just kind of wrap yeah, it around. Exactly. We'll make it work. Yeah. And I think that probably like will bite me in the ass later on in life with like, arthritis or whatever like my Probably. shoulder is a little like a little more fucked on that side but like i don't know put some peptides in there call it a day you're Dude, good to go yeah <laughs> bro, fucking go to mexico <laughs> go get that shit shot up by some like yeah all natural yeah i'm not trying to get snipped dude is this wood i don't know dude okay i don't think so why uh, i just want to knock on some wood oh yeah well, okay that right there like... yeah there you go Perfect. with, with a good God. shoulder yeah exactly with a good shoulder yeah when you broke your sinus bone did you have to get anything done on your nose like surgery wise yeah no i actually got super lucky dude i went in kind of the same scenario i went in and uh i went in the next day i think or i forget if it was the same day or next day but i went in and they uh they got it looked at with the x-ray and it was like broken inwards and it was like totally you disconnected lucky bastard yeah and um when the bone like broke off 
um, they were like, yeah, we're going to have to like, get surgery to like put it together. But that was like, I think, uh, like at the end of the week. And they were like, but we can't do it now. We have to wait till Monday. Uh, I think due to the inflammation, like they're scheduling or whatever. And I was like, all right, cool. I'll come in Monday. And I come in Monday thinking like, I right, fuck like the whole weekend. I'm like, fuck, I have to get surgery. And I was like, not mentally prepared for it. And then I go in Monday and then they get another x-ray. They're like, all right, let's see where it's at. And it was like completely misaligned. And then it went to realigned in like two days. Hell yeah. And they were like, dude, this like normally never happens, but you got, dude, I feel lucky. like you got some fucking superhuman bodily healing function. <laughs> no, fucking dude. breaking collarbones, not feeling it, growing new muscles, <laughs> fucking bones healing. <laughs> I think fucking I'm just lucky the, as shit. Dude. The Yoel Romero of Atlanta. Nah, dude, if I'm the Yoel Romero, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> I tell people I like go to a testosterone clinic and I'm sponsored by them and like do TRT and people look at me and still don't believe me. And I'm like, man, fuck you, dude. That's fucking disrespectful. I'm on some shit. I swear it's working i swear uh but uh it's medical it's medical dosed i medically qualified That's my t- my t levels were like half of what they should have been below half what they should have been no shit yeah they were like 350 and it's supposed to be like much higher than that god damn yeah so i mean dude if i'm healing up at 350 imagine me at fucking nine thousand. dude know what fuck I mean? yeah fuck the <laughs> medical dose take the good shit get on yeah. some fucking chris bumstead like ronnie uh, coleman shit <laughs> fucking put 1200 milligrams of testosterone in your yeah, system yeah dude fuck it what could go wrong dude uh, other than your heart dude, oh you have a heart problem that, yeah. <laughs> that might not be the best course uh, of action but i mean I, yeah i feel like uh i haven't had too many like crazy injuries it's like i've had a couple like weird ones that have happened but like nothing like super catastrophic where like I have to take off for like a year and get surgery again. Yeah, stain. Yeah, yeah. Can just fucking keep knocking on. Yeah, I oh, you got what? The- you got the, like right there. Where? A little, a little behind you. Oh, the little thing. Yeah, there you go. That's easier. Yeah, get it with both arms. But uh, yeah, I, I I'm lucky in that regard. Um, yeah, I don't know what it is, man. Dude, I've never felt like a bigger pussy in my entire life. I Why? Had to, I had to get a septum surgery. My Uh-oh. septum was like super deviated. From baseball or sports dude, or whatever? I was born that way, apparently. And Damn. just didn't know. You just born a bulldog? Dude, yeah. I was just born. I was literally born like a French bulldog, dude. <laughs> just can't breathe. <laughs> dude, that's basically what it was. I'm sorry to hear that, and, dude. Uh, dude, I literally, both shoulders done, my appendix taken out, like, was, like all this shit, the most painful of all of And I mean, like, the most painful was the nose. Can you breathe now? I can. Let me hear it. Oh yeah, that's nice. Isn't that it? was way too much eye contact <laughs> during that. Um, yeah, literally, it was like that. I had an aura ring that I would wear, and it was like every night. It was like my sleep score was or my like um, efficiency or whatever. It was mm-hmm. like you slept for seven hours. You were only asleep for four and a half of them. And I'm like, what the fuck? And I like kept getting looked at. And I was having all this like fucking nose problems, and the guy was like, your septum is like violently deviated. Like you get like no. Oxygen so you're just like waking up in the middle and I do can't breathe type shit. I wouldn't wake up. Oh. Like I never like it wasn't like sleep apnea where I'd like lurch out of bed, but it was just like I was apparently sleeping like dog shit. They like did like put a little thing on me. I like went to sleep. They're like, you woke up 17 times last night. And I was like, oh, good. No wonder I feel like shit all the time. Yeah. And uh, literally they like go in, fix your uh, nose. It's like a septoplasty and a turbinectomy. Oh, sick. Yeah, I know. Those. I know what those mean. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they go in. You have these things in your nose called turbinates that apparently like clean the air that go into you. Okay. And uh, my nose was super fucked up. So they straighten that. They shove these two like basically little. You know, when you have to like put like the stronger nail into the wall, you can't just do the nail. You have to do the shit that like expands mm-hmm. kind of, you know, what I'm talking about? they basically put two of those in your fucking nose. Which doctor are you at? Um, is it an OBGYN? Or go in there, get you with those clamps, open you up. <laughs> it's fucking disrespectful this is, first you come on here and you don't understand how much pcp costs <laughs> yeah and now you're calling me a pussy this is not okay um, i didn't even mean it like that <laughs> <laughs> oh that's what i thought you meant i was no, like no. god damn dude no no no, no i was no, like i'll just, catch uh, you fucking strays no no no, no, no. i was uh, just making a clamp but, joke yeah basically okay. uh, uh put uh, little clamps in there and they like trimmed the little things in your nose bag and the dude i went back in and the guy was like yeah like we need to cut more of them and i was like i don't really know i had done like no like didn't even read like an article about this shit and i was like let me see what happens if they do this more one of the top side effects was something called hollow face syndrome the number one side effect is suicide oh my god because they cut so many of them your face loses all sensation and like the, it feels like you have a hole and it's in the like what is life your face and it drives people insane and they kill themselves and I was like, huh. So in addition to being like wildly painted, dude, I was popping fucking, not Percocet, uh, oxycodone. Bro, I was like, fuck yeah. Big Pharma's awesome. <laughs> I love these guys. Like yeah. I was eating them like they were candy. And uh, yeah, fun. 
That sounds great, dude. Yeah. That sounds terrible. I'm That's why I was asking that. about the fucking thing. I was like, did you have to go through? Because <laughs> no, then I didn't. You, you know Thank who, God. You know who can relate to you who? when you tell people that? Instagram models. Oh, really? That have fucking nose jobs oh, because it's the yeah. same exact like procedure except like that. a different yeah. Is that why your nose looks so beautiful? Thank you. You're welcome. It's the first compliment on my nose I've ever gotten in my life. So <laughs> well, I, I had to do something after all those straights. I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> no, don't. I don't take compliments well. Please don't. Same, same. Just I, insult me. Keep going, but I hate it. it exactly. Yeah, exactly. It, exactly. Stop, like, but don't stop. This is like the first time I've heard this in like years. So please don't stop. But I'm wildly uncomfortable exactly. that it's happening. Yeah, I feel that. <laughs> oh my god. So when uh, when did you open Kazushi Club? So I opened Kazushi Club uh, last year, uh, June second, twenty twenty three was our soft opening date, and then we had our grand opening date uh, in like November that year. Um, so we've been open for like a little over a year or so, um, and uh, yeah, man, it's been it's really awesome having my own space um, and be able to like you know control the culture from like the top down how I wanted to be, and like also too, it's just really nice having a a place where like you know people want to come train with me like for me that's like such a good compliment like if people actually like i have students who drive like an hour each way to come train with me and it's to me that's crazy and uh it's like dude if you're driving from conyers georgia to smyrna to come train with me it's like every time you train with me i want to make sure you get like your money and time's worth from it um which for me like you know you know obviously like like i love jujitsu and stuff like some days i guess are harder than others but like i still like really like what i do so for me it's not really like too hard to like like the teaching and the coaching part like yeah there's difficulties in every profession but like for me that's like the fun part and i think most gym owners would probably resonate with that like the actual jujitsu part's fun it's like the running a business part can be uh difficult at times and it's like a lot more of a 24 7 job than like going in and teach some classes because that's what most people think like on the outside end like oh you just teach some classes bada bing bada boom it's like but there's a lot of stuff outside of that if uh especially if you're like a small business owner you're probably doing all of it and you're probably not outsourcing much at all because you don't have the resources yet to do so, um, which is fine. Like for me, I like the learning process of things. So for me, it's fun, like being able to learn about business and read upon it and like like study about marketing and, you know, sales and stuff like that. So um, I've been enjoying it. What's it's like fun. the you said, like setting the culture up from like top down is mm-hmm. like so you think that's like a conscious thing where you're like, this is the type of person I'm going to like try and attract and try and keep around in the gym. Or? Yeah, for sure. So like there's definitely been people who came by and like they just kind of didn't really fit the vibe in the sense of like a, like the vibe is like a pretty laid back. Um, like we don't bow in, you know, we don't line up. Um, we circle up. Um, we do situationals almost every day and it's like the goal of the situationals is to like get better what we're doing and it's like the whole point of the class is like like i have three things that i'm trying to focus on one like safety like that's got to be number one because if you're getting hurt you can't come back to training one it's like as a business owner you lose clients if they're getting hurt all the time two you know you fucking see people that you like getting hurt (laughs) like it's not fun like watching your students get hurt and it's like uh avoidable you know what i mean so like i'm really big on like you know, watching around the room, make sure you don't run into people. Like I have like a rules poster. It's like a comic book strip and it's like a, it's all really basic rules, but they're like the most important, like no shoes on the mats. Don't be barefoot off the mats, clip your nails, shower before and after class or whatever. Like don't be gross. Can I jump closed guard? Uh, sadly not. Okay. That's a, that's banned in my gym. It's banned techniques. Fucked up. Yeah. I mean, that's like the, the worst leg lock of all time right there. I've had someone do that to me in competition and blew my LCL out. Um, and it sucked. It was like the first 10 seconds of the match too. So it was like, fuck, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, like that top down approach of like, you know, we're here for safety. Like that's number one, two, like you gotta have fun. Like if you're getting better, but you aren't having fun and enjoying it sustainably, it's not going to work out. So like those two things are the most sustainable things you have to get, in my opinion, like for like this is a gym for people who are mostly there to have fun. Like I don't really have anyone who's like a full time guy, like competing all the time. It's mostly people who have jobs and it's like they need to be safe. They need to enjoy it. And then three, they're going to learn something. And it's like if you get those three things, it's like I feel like I did my job type of thing. So um, I enjoy it. Who are the people that have come in or like what about the people that have come in that you've like tried to like steer away uh, from it? Like what have they been like? It's not that I try to steer away from it. I just like have an honest conversation with them. Like if they show up to the gym and I kind of feel like they are trying to prove something, then it's like I kind of tell them, like, hey, man, like we're not really like that type of gym where we're like I'm going to judge you or belittle you if you like do the move wrong or if like if you don't fuck people like if you just fuck everybody up, I'm just going to like like give you like, here's a belt dude like promote you on the spot type of thing it's like it's not really about that it's like 
how you carry yourself, the knowledge, like all that stuff is really important. Obviously, skill is very important too. Like you can't have just knowledge, but like it takes more than just being good at jujitsu for me to want to promote you. Like you have to be a good training partner. Like I don't want to promote you if you're not a good training partner. And because uh, then that looks bad on me um, and like what I deem is important for the culture of the gym. So like I've had to have talks like that with people before where I'm like, hey, like, you know, if that's not really what you're looking for, that's fine. There's tons of gyms. And I tell people up front, even like when they are thinking about signing up, I'm like, hey, like, you know, you try a free class or whatever. But like, you know, there's also free classes at tons of gyms. I'd recommend do some research. And I end up getting a lot of like educated consumers, I feel like because of that. Like, I don't really get random people walking off the street who are like, oh, it's jujitsu. Like, you know, every once in a while, but like, they're not really like your number one customer. The number one customer for me is someone who's like, put some research into what jujitsu is. And like, they kind of already know what it is. And maybe they've trained at other gyms before they've popped in at classes elsewhere. So they have something to compare it to. And if someone doesn't, and I'm like the first gym they've ever been to, like, you know, if they want to sign up, they want to sign up. But I also tell them like, you should also try another gym to see because maybe that vibe is going to be better for you. And that's fine. That's just like how business works. You know, it's just different business owners run their business, how they see accordingly, because it's their business, you know. Um, but that's just how I like to run my business. Like, you know, everyone's going to be pretty tight knit. Everyone's going to train with everybody. Like you should be able to train with people much smaller than you uh, to some degree. Obviously, like if you're a 300 pound guy, you probably don't need to be rolling with a 120 pound girl in class. But like, uh, like for me, I'm like 180, 185. I can roll with people smaller than me, people bigger than me. And like, it's fine. Like we're not going to get hurt. Um, and that's what you want. Um, and that's the kind of environment that I strive for in the gyms. Like people feel safe. People feel like, you know, we're trying to actually get better and it feels like safe physically, but also like mentally, like you're not walking on eggshells. Like you don't need to like tie your belt facing away from me type shit or like call me like grandmaster type of stuff. You know what I mean? It's like, bro, it's, you can just call me Muhammad. You can call me coach if you want to, you know what I mean? But like, there's no like weird title you got to call me. Um, and that's okay if you want to run your gym like that, but it's like, it's just going to give off a different vibe. And I don't want to give off that vibe. I want people to know, like, I am just a dude. I'm just a guy teaching you how to fight other guys on the floor. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's not that serious. What's, like, the most difficult or um, what are the things you see? I'm assuming you have, like, a, a decent number of guys that are, like, brand-new white belts. I know you said that's not, like, the typical client. I, I, have a like, hand, I have a good bit of, like, new white belts, though, yeah. What's, like, the number one thing that is most difficult to train out of someone, like, off of the street in jiu-jitsu? Uh, just controlling their breathing and pacing. That's usually like the hardest part for most people when they first start because it's like easier for you to want to go balls to the wall in like a one minute situational round. And then you realize we're going to do like five or six of them and you're like, oh, you know what I mean? So I usually like will give people a guideline. Something that I try to do as well is like if you have to try harder than like 60 percent, it's like your technique sucks. Just focus on that then. Um, and obviously there's a time and place for competitive rounds. But like we're just talking generally right now for like learning and skill development. Um so like a good rule of thumb I use is like breathing through my nose. If I have to breathe through my mouth constantly and like take big deep breaths, it's like I'm probably using too much energy. Let me slow things down, focus on breathing, control my breathing through my nose and like have better like uh, nasal breathing through my stomach. And it kind of calms you down a little bit more. You're more likely to like make the right choice. Or if you don't, you like will take note of it and you're like, all right, I did this wrong. Let me ask the coach afterwards what I should be doing here. Like that's something I try to do. Because if you're going really fast, it's hard to even know what's going on sometimes. So when you go to try to recreate it and try to learn from it, it's like it's kind of hard. You're like at a hundred percent like fight or flight mode. So it's hard to really recall it. But if you slowed it down, you'd be able to recall it more. Um and maybe you even make the right decision. Um and then that stops you from you know building bad habits and then also too of like possibly injuring yourself or others. And that's not necessarily like just a new person thing. Like I know people uh who've been training for a while. I've had that issue for a while where I was just going too hard and just like not getting better. And also just injuring myself just from going too hard. And like a lot of that can be like how like the culture is brought up in the gym because people inherently do it, I feel like, when they're new. And if the culture is like go hard every day, it almost like encourages that. And then that's not really the best for learning and like longevity, in my opinion. So like it's important for me as the coach to like make people aware of it because like some gyms are like, oh, you just beat them up and go harder. But it's like that's not really teaching them anything. Um, that's very autistic of you to do that. Like, it's just, just talk to them as an adult and be like, Hey, you got to just calm down. It's okay. Like if they get mad because I told them they need to relax, it's like, well, they probably weren't going to be a student that was going to enjoy training here in the first place. So that solved itself. Um, either they're going to adapt or they're just going to not like it and they're just going to go train somewhere else. And that's fine. You know what I mean? 
Um, so that's kind of like how I try to like do it at culture wise. Um, and that's kind of like one of the harder parts for newer people is slowing down because like I said, like it's very innate to want to just go harder. Um, like you, this problem will get resolved if I just put more effort into it. Yeah. And even like I have newer white belts that'll still sometimes do it to some degree, but like, dude, they've only been training for a few months and it's like, they're picking up a lot faster because they started to like, listen, when I said like, slow things down and they would pick things up at an exponentially uh, faster rate than if they just try to go super hard all the time. And they're also way less likely to get injured. And it's like, that's the biggest thing is like, I don't want like injuries to happen all the time. It's like, if we can avoid it, let's avoid it. It's already inherently dangerous what we're doing. Let's kind of reduce that risk, especially in training. Let's not make it more dangerous, more likely that people get fucked up and don't get to train. And Exactly. So I think that's like a big part of it. There's probably a lot of, I mean, I have no idea what the white belt attrition rate is, but I bet a ton of people that stop training at white belt, it's because they get hurt at white belt from some like fucking white belt, like all out war. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, okay, I don't think this is for me. Like I did this for four months and I got my fucking elbow popped. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. And I think like uh, being overwhelmed because jujitsu is very overwhelming. It's just like when you first start off, it feels like there's a million different things and million of positions. Like really, there's not. There's only so many positions, only so many submissions. Uh, whereas like when you first start, it's sometimes not taught from like an end game approach. And that's something that I've tried to do now in teaching is like teaching backwards. So like uh, my coach, Sean, he does this really well. It's like he'll teach end game first. So like how to like really the most important thing you should learn in jiu-jitsu first is the rear naked choke. Yeah. And learn back mount and then work backwards from there. So in two ways, one, you understand how to finish. Because if you can get to the back, like think about how many street fights you've seen people get behind people and like it, they get that they know it's something good, but they don't know how to finish. So they don't finish. But if you can just get that finish and understand that end game and then work backwards from there and then it teaches you a few different things. One, like how to finish Two, that everything is kind of a pit stop on the way. Like think about how you defend a lot of submissions or positions. Like a lot of times you inherently turn your back uh, and give up your back. But it's because you didn't want to get pinned down or you didn't want to get arm barred or you didn't want to get leg locked. So you turned and exposed your back. So everything's going to funnel to that back mount position, especially if someone's good, like you're going to have to eventually probably take their back and choke them. That's like the most high percentage thing. Um, so if you can start from there and then fill in the gaps, otherwise you're like, why are we here in mount? Why are we here in back mount? Why are we here? in slow? what's the point of all this? There's no context. So it teaches you that how to work backwards. And then also too, it's a lot safer to start from more controlled positions when you're newer than to like start standing. Standing is like the most dangerous oh, thing to God, practice because yeah. you could just fall weird and break your leg. Oh, dude, fall I was wrong. Like it can yeah. seriously. I, I had someone who uh, he was like a much bigger guy. He uh, was older and he was just getting back into jiu jitsu. It was like a long time ago at a different gym. And he did like military combatives or something. And I was like, all right, cool. Like when we get to sparring, like, you know, it's your first day back. Like maybe don't spar your first day back. Like how long has it been since he's trained? He's like, oh, it's been like 20 years. And I was like, man maybe don't you know what i mean and he's a much bigger guy and it's like that's like you know it's a lot of stress on your joints if you fall weird and he was like no nah, man i'll be fine and i was like man i really don't think you should like just for your own safety like i'm a professional in this and i'm going to tell you this right now my professional opinion today probably just do technique maybe situationals maybe and then uh probably just don't do regular sparring and he was like ah no i'm gonna do it and i was like all right man you're an adult do what you want then and i said that i was like if you get hurt it's not my problem because you said it and damn, I guess I manifested that shit because he was rolling someone and he was on his knees and someone made him like post his arm out and he dislocated his shoulder. It wasn't even like crazy. I watched it happen. It was just like, it was a very like mild post. Posted weird and pop. And just dislocated his shoulder. And then he started freaking out. And uh, the owner was like, dude, what are we going to do? And I was like, well, I told him, I think <laughs> I'm such an asshole. I think I was like, maybe we can build a time machine. He can go back and listen to me when I said, don't roll. I had an attitude just because I was like, <laughs> I told him for like three minutes straight, like I'm arguing with a grown man. I'm like, don't do it before class. And then when it gets to rolling, he's like, I'm still going to roll. And I was like, all right, man, I told you not to, but do what you want to do. And then he heard himself in like the first 10 seconds. And then, uh, yeah, I said what I said, but uh, build that time machine, go back and fucking listen to me. <laughs> How about that, dude? But, Boom, um, solved your problem. Yeah, exactly. And then they were like, oh, well, like someone like I think like someone who was like a doctor at the time helped and they try to ask me and I was like I'm not a doctor so I don't know what you want me to do with a dislocated shoulder especially after I told you to not roll so he ended up at like going to a hospital somewhere getting his shoulder fixed. he never came back but also too it's like I tried what I could um so yeah like I feel like safety has got to be number one otherwise like you know 
you're going to get injured, can't train, and you're going to end up like that guy. You get injured on your first day, essentially. So I'll start in like more controlled positions and work backwards. So you can build off of these like principles, like understand structures, like how to frame, how to like understand inside space of the limbs, uh, weight distribution, posture. So that way, when we go to stand up, it's like you already kind of understand what we're trying to do. Like I'll in a theoretical, like perfect scenario curriculum, because I don't think those exist because uh, the reason why is because like the average student isn't going to come to every class. So yeah. if you think they're going to get every, I tried this in several different gyms, several different scenarios, like every once in a while you get a student who's there every class and they get everything perfectly, like all 10 classes and then they can move on or whatever. But the average student doesn't. So if you have a rotating curriculum, it's kind of hard for everyone to get exactly what they need. So usually I just teach throughout the week, like the same stuff uh, fundamentally that everyone needs to work on that are the most consistent people in the class. Cause if you're not the most consistent, then anything's going to help you. But the most consistent people that on average, what they all need from all belt levels, fundamentally, they'll start there and build from there. That's how I like to teach. But in like a perfect curriculum sense, it would be like from back mount to mount to side mount to guard or half guard, like closed open type guard all the way to stand up. So that way you kind of run through all the different scenarios and we go into like submission chains throughout then. Um, and kind of build off of that. And that way, once you get a stand up, you already have an idea of how things work. So you're less likely to get hurt. You could still definitely get hurt. And like, you have to teach people break falls and how to fall properly because, and how to take people down properly. So they don't like slam each other and post their arms weird stuff like that. But that's how I like to preferably teach. Um, and that's something I've learned from Sean. Uh, something I've read about from other people too. There's a guy named Joshua Waitskins. Waitskins. He's a Marcelo Garcia black belt. And he's, uh, he's got this book, I believe it's called the art of learning. He's like a, really good chess player you know there's that parallel between chess and jiu-jitsu i fucking suck at chess so i don't get it but just fun i'm glad you think so i suck at it so i hate it and i'm just kidding i, uh, still, I love it and i still suck at it nice so. it is fun <laughs> i i try it every now and then it's really like the and so this is, goes back to what i'm saying like i'll get to the end of chess and i'm like all right it's time to checkmate and it's like i can't get the checkmate and it's like fuck i hate this game it's like <laughs> you know what I, mean? I get into that like lull of like it's like almost like in a sub only tournament and a guy just shells up and you're trying to sub him and he's like doing everything and you're like yeah i'm not good enough to like figure this out yeah and it's like that's what i'm trying to avoid with my students essentially if i can like start from the end game and work backwards so if you do get these good positions you know how to actually make it count because if you can just pass someone's guard a million times but you can't hold them down and sub them and it's like well what's the point that makes sense um so that was like something I learned from Sean and I've seen from other people, uh, like how they thought about it. And I feel like that helped me a lot as a competitor and like a practitioner, but also just as an instructor, how I break it down for people. Cause I feel like, like we talked about like jujitsu is very overwhelming. So if you can kind of give them a little, like, I don't want to say like, uh, what's that, what's that thing that people call people love it. It's like a flow chart. Oh yeah. It's yeah, like, yeah. I think that's true to some degree, but it's like really just a framework because your flow chart is going to look different than my flow chart. Mm -hmm. but we have the same framework like we all have to use mount and side mount and back mount to some degree in their variance um so if we can like build that framework and give you fundamental principles to build on and concepts and then you can just take that and apply it in your game will look a little different than mine but fundamentally it's based on the same stuff and that's going to be the most higher percentage and that's like what i try to do when teaching uh not just for getting better faster but then also for safety because like if your first class is takedowns, it's like, I mean, you, you could be totally safe. I've had that happen to people. And it's like, but also too, like you are more likely to get injured. Dude, even if you know what you're doing on takedowns, it's like, I th thought I, yeah, I came so close to blowing my knee out. Also, like if you have any sort of like time and you got to bounce, just let me know. Yeah. I have to leave in a minute actually. No, no worries, dude. Yeah. I don't even know how long. Yeah. We've been down here for a fucking hot minute. Yeah. <laughs> um, I literally thought that I was almost blew my knee out doing really? stand up, and it literally wasn't anything either of us did wrong. I stepped in like we were like, I can't even remember what it was. I think we were in like some sort of over under. I had like a Russian time. Mm -hmm. I don't remember, but I like stepped where there was like a sweat puddle. Oh, and yeah. I, I felt my knee buckle and I yeah. was like, I'm going to sit down now. Exactly. Like, I don't know why I'm doing this shit. Yeah, takedowns but. are inherently more dynamic. And, like, I think some people don't understand that. Like, there's a reason why there's not really, like, absolute weight divisions in wrestling. It's, yeah. like, it's inherently more dynamic. And, like, there's more – people can produce more power from their feet compared to, like, on their butt or on their back. And it's, like, yeah. it's, a, it's a very different world. And also watching white belts break fall, like, brand new white belts break uh, fall. It's terrifying. Well, you can be a black world champion not how to break fall like Marigali. <laughs> this is true and <laughs> it's a great place to end that <laughs> yeah that's a perfect ending all right muhammad ibrahim yes sir thank you sir thank you um, Dallas. also any sort of like 
plug. I mean, not like this thing is going to have like thousands and thousands of views, Shit, but like I know. get a, I get a hundred or two hundred hey, sometimes. That's something, yeah. But it's better than me, yeah. Kazushi Club, yep. your Instagram. Oh, what is it? Habibi Tenth Planet Jiu Jitsu. Uh, Habibi Dot Jitsu Ten P, and then uh, Instagram is Kazushi Club ATL. Um, and that's my gym in Smyrna. We're inside a World Gym. We're right off South Cobb Drive. So if you want to come train, come train. Um, and then I want to give a shout out to my sponsors, Nation Athletic. You know Mark. Yeah, Man, absolutely. I fucking unk. love Mark. Yeah, that's my uncle, dude. We look alike, dude. One time yeah. I saw a picture of someone posting <laughs> yeah. of us, and it was him rolling with one of my students. And I was like, I don't remember rolling with that guy. And then I would look closer. I was like, oh, it's fucking Mark. I was like, damn, dude. I'm getting up there. Uh, but that's my boy, Mark. I love Mark Sharma. And then uh, Game Day Men's Health. I'm sponsored by them. Uh, they're in like a Buckhead, like Atlanta, Midtown area. They're a men's health clinic, so they got peptides, TRT, all that good stuff. Ozempic, trying to get that body right. Hell yeah, yeah, dude. I'm about to hop on Ozempic. That sounds fun. Hop on everything, dude. Why not? Fuck it. Ozempic and TRT. Let's yeah, exactly, go. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> so uh, shout out to them uh, and uh, my coach, Sean Applegate, all my teammates in Atlanta for beat my ass. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks for you for having me on, dude. This dude, is this awesome. is fun as fuck. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Yes, sir.